I would like to call the City of Wheat Ridge Planning Commission for April 4th, 2019 to order. Can I get a roll call of members, please? Melissa Antle. Here. Daniel Larson. Here. Janet Leo. Here. Scott Ohm. Here. Richard Peterson. Here. Jahi Simbai. Here. Vivian Voss. Present. The next order on the agenda is the Pledge of Allegiance. Please rise. Is there a motion to approve the order of the agenda? Uh, I'll make a motion to approve the order of the agenda. Is there a second? Are there any additions or corrections to the agenda? Seeing none, call for a vote. Motion passed, seven to zero. Is there a motion to approve the order of minutes for March 21st, 2019? I move to approve the minutes of March 21st, 19 as presented to us. Is there a second? Second. Are there any additions or corrections to the order of the minutes? Um, I, I have a, it's a clarification more than anything else. On page four, two paragraphs above election of officers. Um, the, the reason I raised the question about renters, uh, it says here that, that I support uh, short and long-term renters. That, that sort of came out eventually, but, but the point I was really making is I was trying to raise a question about the impact of short and long-term rentals on neighborhood engagement, stability, and the housing market. Uh, so I was really raising questions about rentals in the city of Wheat Ridge, and I wasn't, I did mention a, a, a renter's rights, but renter's rights usually get to the point where they have ex, um, inspections of rental properties and um, sort of rules and regulations. But my, my point was to raise questions about neighborhood engagement stability in the, in the housing market. Would you we can make that amendment. Um, so if somebody just wants to uh, amend the motion to say as amended, and we'll update it to clarify that. Okay. Yeah, if you want to make that motion to amend. Okay. Also, to motion to accept the minutes, I make a motion to amend as Richard's wording. And the second? I'll second. Okay. Call for a vote. Motion passed seven to zero. This is the time for any person uh, to speak on any subject not appearing on tonight's agenda. We have three public hearings cases. Is there any? No one has signed up for the public forum. Okay, uh, that would conclude the public forum. <clears throat> we will proceed. Uh, I'd just like to welcome the members of the public and ask that you respect the statements made by city staff, applicant, and my fellow planning commissioners during the proceedings. Uh, I would like to now open up the public hearing for case number WS-18-06, an application filed by Toll Southwest LLC for approval of a major subdivision for a 200 unit townhome development for property zone mixed use commercial TOD and located at 5060 Ward Road. Uh, before uh, we have a pre uh, presentation from the staff, I would like to make one statement. I'd like to make a disclosure that I am currently working on projects with CBL consultants. I've had no direct contact with CBL consultants in regard to this case and that knowing working with CBL consultants does not affect my ability to be objective on this case. Thank you, Mr. Ohm. Just to clarify for the record, I'll ask you two quick questions um, based on your disclosure. Do you have any financial interest in this application? No, I do not. And do you believe you're able to make a fair and impartial vote on this application? Yes, I do. Thank you. Uh, and 
I would like to also swear anybody who plans to speak tonight on this specific case, with the applicant staff and anyone from the public who plans to testify or comment, please stand and raise your right hand. Do you swear to tell the truth in this matter as you know it? Thank you, and I ask for the staff report. Thank you. Um, good evening. For the record, Lauren McClack. I'm a planner with the City of Wheat Ridge Community Development Department, and I will be presenting tonight's case. I would like to enter into the public record the contents of the case file, the zoning ordinance, the subdivision regulations, and the contents of this digital presentation. The property is within the City of Wheat Ridge. All appropriate notification requirements have been met, and the Planning Commission does have jurisdiction to hear this case. So noted. Thank you. Um, so we'll start, as we often do, with an aerial. Um, the subject property is outlined in that bright blue color, and it's located at the far northwest corner of the city. Um, that other shading that you see actually indicates our neighboring jurisdiction. So the purple color is unincorporated Jefferson County, and the green color is the city of Arvada. Um, the site's about 13 and a half acres in size and has frontage on three streets. So. Uh, Ridge Road to the south, Ward Road to the west, and West 52nd Avenue to the north. Um, it's adjacent to the Wheat Ridge Ward Station commuter rail station. That's RTD's gold line um, that is set to open at the end of this month at long last. Uh, you can see in this aerial the RTD surface parking lot here, the station area um, to the south of Ridge Road, and then this diagonal line that traverses the image is the railroad right away that includes the commuter rail and the heavy rail. This next image is an excerpt from our zoning map. Um, the property again is outlined in blue and that bright blue color designates um, the mixed use commercial transit oriented development zone district, MUCTOD. Um, the property was rezoned to that zone district in 2012 uh, previously on this site, the Jolly Rancher factory was located here, the candy manufacturer. Um, they closed in 2002 and the site has been unused since that time. Um, buildings were demolished over time and it's now vacant. Um, you can see from this zoning map that the immediately surrounding zonings are purple in color and that indicates commercial or industrial uses. So just going maybe clockwise around the site, we have a gas station at the hard corner. Um, manufacturing uses, uh, RV storage, the parking lot and station, um, boat storage, a landscaper, a steel manufacturer, CrossFit, auto repair, sort of a variety of uses in the immediate area. And then some more residential uses as you work towards the east. This MUN mixed use neighborhood is a, an approved townhome product that's likely to get under construction here any day now. Um, and then a more established lower density neighborhood in this residential two zone district. The MUC TOD zone district was created through a code amendment about 10 years ago specifically for properties within a half mile of a transit station. Um, there's only two properties with that designation right now, the subject site and another property adjacent to the station. Um, that zoning allows for residential uses or commercial uses or a mix of the two. It doesn't mandate mixed use. Um, and the standards in that zone district are specifically designed to encourage densities that support transit and encourage site and building design that enhance connections to transit. We've really done a substantial amount of planning in this area. Um, so in 2013, we updated the sub-area plan for this area. 2016, we had a vision plan that we created. And we've done a lot of infrastructure planning here more recently based on the bond that was approved by Wheat Ridge voters uh, about two years ago. So the land use vision here calls for a mix of uses, including residential and employment, um, both of which are needed to create a well-balanced transit-oriented neighborhood. Um, but as the commission is aware, tonight's case is a subdivision, so it will not affect the zoning or the permitted uses on the property. Which leads us to the purpose of a subdivision plat. Um, it's a technical document and it prepares land for any development that's already permitted by the underlying zoning. So again, we're not looking at the merits of the proposed use, just at the lots, tracks, right of way, and easements that would ensure the land um, is adequately prepared and the infrastructure is appropriately designed for whatever use is proposed and already allowed. 
Um, I mentioned that specifically in this case because, as I mentioned in the staff report, um, there are other active applications associated with this property right now. A concept plan and site plan are under review. Those are eligible in this zone district to be reviewed administratively. Um, in this case, the proposed development is 200 townhome units. Often when you look at a townhome plot, you get a sense of the site plan because of the way the lots are configured. Because of the fact that this subdivision involves the dedication of new full width public streets and because of the number of lots involved, you will review this um, application tonight and then city council will make a final decision at the end of the month. So with that, we'll look at the subdivision plat. It's actually eight pages. I know this is illegible, but this is the cover sheet. It includes a legal description and signature blocks. Um, the next couple of sheets are also illegible. They include some standard notes that we'll talk about um, as they arise. And then those tables, we require that all plats show a list of the size of all lots and tracks. In this case, we're talking about 201 lots and about 50 tracks. Sheet four shows the existing conditions. So those are existing lot lines and easements that were in place and were appropriate when the property was being used as the Jolly Rancher factory. Um, that configuration worked for that use, but doesn't work for the proposed um, development. So this sheet simply removes all the existing lot lines and some easements. Uh, often those are done either by plat or by separate document and that's all documented here. Sheet 5 is the one that we'll really focus on tonight um, as the graphic that will explain some of the features of this subdivision, including the streets, lots, open space, and drainage. Um, there are three other sheets in the set, but they're zoomed in simply um, so the hard copies are more legible. But again, this graphic will suffice, I think, for, for our discussion now. Um, the portion of the image that is now shaded in red, so on the perimeter of the property, shows the right-of-way dedication um, that's proposed along the three perimeter streets. Anytime we have a subdivision or any development in the city, we look at the adjacent streets to see if they meet current city standard. And in this case, all three are substandard in width. Um, our standard in this area would call for detached sidewalks. So sufficient widths of right of way are being dedicated on 52nd Ward and Ridge to accommodate detached sidewalks. In the case of Ward Road, which is a state highway, they've required an XLD cell lane. And in the case of Ridge Road, our standard requires on-street parking also. So that's why those two are quite a bit wider um, than 52nd. The interior of the site um, has several roadway dedications. Those are now also shaded in red. Um, the sub-area plan for this area has long called for an improved street grid. It's sort of a mega block up there right now, which made sense when it was an industrial campus for a factory, but not quite as much sense um, for a transit-oriented neighborhood. Uh, the mixed-use zoning in particular actually has maximum block length requirements, so we have to um, create some public streets in this area to reduce the size of the block. Um, in this case, they're dedicating an east-west street that we're calling West 51st Avenue. They're dedicating Vivian Street in the middle of the site and then Union Court on the far eastern side. Those two north-south streets are um, dedicated in those specific locations so that we can align with other infrastructure surrounding the area. So in the vicinity map that just popped up, the dashed lines is the new street grid. The black line is the existing alignment of Vivian Street to the north. Um, and then over here is the existing alignment of Union Court. Obviously, there's a little bit of a disconnect here, but creating a street grid is incremental and takes time. So we're getting this Union Court dedication now with the understanding that this connection may not be made for, for a while, frankly, un unless and until those other properties were to develop. That said, um, the applicant will be responsible for constructing all of these public streets with the exception of the shaded area on Union Court where the sidewalk will be extended, but the full width of that roadway is not necessary to be constructed at this time. The project is served also by a series of private alleys, and those just appeared in the dashed lines. The townhome um, development is proposed to be all alley loaded, and uh, you can see that, that configuration here. Um, each of the numbered rectangles that wrap then on the public streets and wrap the alleys are the, the single townhome lots. So I mentioned there, uh, there are 200 townhome lots, um, they're about 20 to 23 feet in width, based on the s typical size of a townhome. And the average lot size is about 1,200 square feet. So again, um, 
the majority of that 1,200 square feet is consumed by the footprint of the townhome building. In 2009, the voters of Wheat Ridge exempted this area, not this property specifically, but the larger area from any density um, cap that we have in our charter. So the number of lots that are being created is consistent with the zoning. Um, the plat also creates one larger lot at the southeast corner of the property, now shaded in blue here. Um, it's sized for commercial uses or for potentially a mixed use building, but it would be a part of a future phase of development. So no specific plans for that area. All of the alleys on the image are going to be dedicated as tracks. Um, tracks are a portion of land that's not developable lot, but serves some other function. So in addition to alleys, um, the tracks would include open space, sidewalks, utilities, and drainage. And two of the largest open space tracks are what are now shaded in green in the image. Um, these two tracks, U and W, provide an open space amenity, sort of a pocket park there along Vivian Street, and then a pedestrian walk or paseo, which is that linear east-west um, connection here that would be hardscaped. Our document, City's Vision, um, calls for recreational uses in this area, and these two tracks are also encumbered by an easement that would require public access to those amenities. For this project, um, the drainage is proposed to be underground in two uh, detention vaults, one underneath that paseo, which has just changed to blue, and another one under the southeast alley. Um, the, the site's large enough and there's significant slope in the area. Um, the detention would need to accommodate not only the new runoff created by the impervious surface, but also historical flows, which would go into those two detention vaults and discharge into existing storm sewer in Ridge Road and then be conveyed down to a regional detention pond that RTD actually built about a half mile to the east at Ridge and Rob Street. In terms of maintenance of all of these areas, um, I haven't shaded all 50 tracks, but there are other open space amenities. There's utility easements within those tracks. Um, it's a lot of common space for a project, and often we see a homeowners association be required to maintain and own those common spaces. That will be the case um, here, in addition to a metropolitan district. Um, when the zoning was approved for this property in 2012, a metropolitan district was created. Um, those are special districts that can own and maintain common areas, and in addition to what a typical HOA can do, they can also fund um, improvements by issuing bonds. So in this case, we're likely gonna see both an HOA and a metro district. Um, the authority and the role of a metro district is written out in what we call a service plan. Um, that service plan needs to be updated and it will be presented to City Council here in the coming months. In terms of the subdivision review process, um, we've reviewed it internally and we also send it to any agency or district that has to serve the property or would have infrastructure here. So you see a list of some of the agencies who responded to our comments. Those who are not listed here um, did not respond and are notified that if they didn't respond, we assume they don't have concerns. So those not listed would be Comcast and CenturyLink. The applicant um, is coordinating with all applicable utility agencies and no, no specific concerns have either been raised or um, ha are yet unresolved. Everything is, is sort of ready to go and that's why we're presenting tonight. Um, in advance of this hearing, we had a two week public noticing period and we've only received one inquiry, no letters of objection or support specifically for this project. Um, ultimately, we are recommending approval of the plat um, because it does meet the subdivision regulations and all agencies can serve the project. Um, there's no discretionary criteria uh, for review for subdivision plat, um, but we are recommending three conditions of approval. One, which you don't see quite as often, so I'll explain a little bit. Um, the first two conditions relate to agreements that we typically execute with a subdivision plat. We often require a subdivision improvement agreement, and that's the document that explains who's responsible for installing which infrastructure and by what time, in what time frames. Um, Often, uh, as I mentioned, the metro district may have a role in either the funding or construction of that infrastructure, but their service plan needs to be updated. So in this instance, we will use a development covenant that would obligate the developer to make those improvements um, and then be able to record the plat. We'll then update the metro district service plan 
and subsequently execute the subdivision improvement agreement so that the Metro District can be a party to that agreement. So we will ultimately use two documents instead of one to compel the developer to complete the improvements that are required by code and presented tonight. The third condition relates to the parkland fees. As I mentioned, some of the open space shown in those larger tracks would be accessible to the public. Um, all residential subdivisions are required to either dedicate parkland or pay a fee in lieu. The size of those two tracks does not fulfill that entire obligation, so they would be required to pay a fee for the balance that's owed, and that would be due before permits. Um, that concludes my presentation. I'm happy to answer questions, and I know the applicant is also here in the audience. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Commissioner Peterson, do you have any questions? Yes. Um, first of all, I like to know context. So on the zoning map, the, there's the blue, the, the, the MUC, the transit oriented development. And then there's, a, I, I realize that this isn't what we're supposed to be considering tonight, but it's context. There's a large arc. Yes. At the right end yes. of it, would you? I assume that's access from the development. Are you talking about this area? Yeah. Yeah. So the history, um, you, know, it's not uncommon for our zoning maps to look a little bit like patchwork quilts. Zoning often follows the property lines. Um, before RTD purchased the land for their parking lot and the station area, the subject parcel that was owned for the Jolly Rancher factory was actually the boundary that's shown in blue. So they had a railroad spur that came into the property and the boundary at that time included all of this area that was shaded in blue. When the zoning was changed in 2012, RTD had not yet concluded their property negotiations. So the whole parcel that was previously that boundary was rezoned. Um, when RTD came, purchased the property and came in to get their entitlement for the station area, a parking lot for a transit station is allowed as a special use in IE and as a permitted use in the MUC TOD. So when the mix, when sort of that split zoning doesn't affect the land use, we don't clean up the land use map. So that's sort of a remnant of the historical property boundaries. Are, are there plans for it? Uh, the plan for that area is as shown. So it's the parking lot and then RTD has the ability to extend their parking lot to the north, all of which would be permitted even with the split zoning. So <clears throat> when I was looking at this, it, it, the, it, it, if we, well, we don't need to go back, but if you look at the park area that's designated, mm -hmm. it just ends at Union Court, I believe. Yep. But this is an extension from Union Court, right? So the um, alignment of the park area will be to terminate at a detached sidewalk on Union Court that would then, so you could walk along here and then take a detached sidewalk down to the station area. Eventually, through the 2E bond funds, we intend to build a pedestrian bridge over the tracks and continue a linear park down south to the pond. So it, it doesn't translate in the subdivision plat because it's not a site plan, um, but it is a logical terminus. Right. Since it's a transit-oriented development, it's nice to be able to get people from point A to point B, and right now they have to cross Union Court, right? They'll walk along Union Court, down a sidewalk that you can't see because this isn't the okay. site plan on the western side of Union Court. Okay. Um, a, a question about parks. There are 37,000, approximately, it's probably a little bit over, 37,000 square feet of park designated land. Mm -hmm. um, 200 houses, three people per house average, 600 people. Is, is that enough ground to service 600 people plus the public? Sure, so our parkland dedication requirement uses an industry standard of seven and a half acres per 1,000 people. Um, in this case, the property is only 13 acres in size. So what we typically see is a fee in lieu of parkland dedication. So we have a calculation based on the average household size, based on whether it's in a um, near transit station or in sort of a standard residential neighborhood or a senior housing. Um, we use that seven and a half acres per thousand people to determine what the acreage requirement would be and say, is this reasonable based on the property size and based on our parks master plan. So we send these referrals to our parks department. They look at their master plan too. Um, 
95% of the time we're taking a fee in lieu of land dedication because we can use that to invest in our, our, our existing infrastructure. Um, in this area, because it's not historically neighborhood, there's a lack of park amenities, but we also acknowledge that unless the city is able to sort of participate in creating and managing a public park, um, which we're not, then we're going to have smaller scale amenities like the size of the acreage park that you see here. So I think what you're saying is that this doesn't seem big enough for the number of people. We acknowledge that it's not at that seven and a half acres per thousand, um, but it's also not appropriate to dedicate half of a private development lot. No, I understand that, but it's about, it's, so it's about three acres that should, <coughs> it's about three acres that should be dedicated given a, a Exactly, given that sort of industry standard. Okay. Mm -hmm. Um, so, how, uh, I, I, don't, I don't do acres, um, 37,000 square feet is how many acres? About three quarters. Okay. So, so it's really a very large hunk of land that's not included. If you do ordinary park designation, there's really a very large hunk of land that's not designated as parks that should be required, right? Correct. Okay. That they would pay a fee instead. Yeah. In the absence of this, um, if there wasn't a publicly accessible park here, their parkland dedication fee would be about a half million dollars. Okay. Um, just a couple more. Um, I noticed that Vivian Street and West 51st Street share ground. And, and I mean, you get one street coming this way, one street coming this way. So, I, 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 if the map were bigger, I would ask you the address of a particular place. I mean, it, it, I've dealt with this kind of thing before, and it's really weird when you get in there and try to drive around because you don't know where you are. Sure. So we we have not looked at an addressing plan yet. We usually do that a little bit later when we have an understanding of sort of exactly where front doors will be. Um, from our standpoint, we often address a property like this in conjunction with fire and police um, because first and foremost, an address needs to get them where they need to be in an emergency right. situation. So we will keep that in mind. Yeah, because <clears throat> this, this, Vivian Street comes down and then it's labeled as Viz Vivian Street uh, Yep, it continues below. down here. This is also Vivian Street. Yep. Okay. So the, the fire department and the city can figure out how to tell people how to get to 51st Avenue from 51st Avenue? Correct. So right now it's... Yes. Affected. We have disconnected sort of east-west streets throughout the city. Um, so we'll just make sure that the sequencing of the numbers would indicate that they're in the block uh, west of Vivian versus east of Vivian. Okay. Um, <clears throat> this, uh, this probably goes to the ODP, but what percentage of the total land area is going to be covered? And, and, and my next question is going to be, are there requirements for permeable surfaces anywhere? Like so I animals? don't have an answer for you on impervious surface. That is a site planning question, um, but any, you know, uh, the zoning, also site planning question, the zoning requires at least 15% open space. Um, I suspect this will exceed that. And then any area that is impervious, you know, we have a full drainage report and we've done enough calculations to confirm that the two detention vaults would, would um, okay. appropriately absorb all of those flows. Okay, that's it. Commissioner Simbai. I just have one question on the staff report. Mm -hmm. uh, it says the MUC, <clears throat> this is on page five, it says the MUC TOD zone district does not include minimum lot size and lot width requirements, but the proposed lots appear to be shaped and sized appropriately to accommodate future development. I guess I was just wondering about the appear. What, what does that sure. mean? Sure. So we, the subdivision regulations require a logical lot layout. Um, in the case where there's a minimum size, like in an R1 or an R2, then it has to meet that specific standard. In the absence of a quantitative minimum, we would ensure that the lot layout um, is consistent with the proposed site design. So we're making, so we're not having to replat this later when they come back with buildings. So 
The site plan can't be approved until the subdivision plat proceeds, but as of right now, it does appear that they are consistent. Commissioner Antle. Just, I, I had a follow-up question to what Commissioner Peterson was talking about. Do you have, um, and this might be in the park's master plan, is what is the distance to maybe the nearest park from this development? So if you're not providing that open space within the development itself, sure. there's typical standards for how far should you be from a park to accommodate? Um, off the top of my head, and I could be wrong, so if somebody testifies that knows the area oh, better, okay. to the north outside of Wheat Ridge is the Van Bibber Trail. Um, there will be a new park in the Haskins Ridge project in Arvada immediately to the um, east. And then as you head south off of 44th is Prospect Park. I believe those are the closest ones. And are those within a quarter mile? No, I mean, a quarter mile is basically what you're seeing on the screen. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I would just think as this station area gets developed is to be mindful of what are people's access to parks and amenities if they're not being provided within the development itself. Thank you. Any other questions? No, that's it. Thank you. Commissioner Larson. I have two questions, please. Um, the, this diagram we see here, we see the, uh, along Ward and Ridge, um, the setbacks of whatever the standard distance is, but it doesn't indicate on what you're showing here on 52nd Avenue, is that, um, is that a different application then? I'm sorry, can you repeat? The, the setback from the, the, the street. Um, so none of the setbacks are shown here. The zoning would not require setback. Um, the dashed lines that are shown on the lots are the easement locations. So the, the red, sorry, Mark Westbrook Public Works, the red areas along those three streets are the right-of-way dedications that you're seeing there, not, not setbacks if that's what you're talking about on this diagram. Uh, along Ward and along, along Ward and Ridge are much bigger right away dedications than what's along 52nd. 52nd. Yeah. And, and why is that? It's just the, the nature of what street is going to be built and what existing right away is. So they all end up with very similar stuff behind the curb. It's just we happen to have a lot more existing right away on 52nd than we have along Ward and Ridge. Okay. Okay. Thank you. And my uh, uh, second question is. Um, uh, when you, Ward Road is a very busy street, especially during rush hour, and uh, there is a light uh, already at 52nd. Mm -hmm. uh, with the opening of the, uh, the train, there will be a lot of traffic coming in and off of Ridge, and I'm not sure if there's a, a traffic light planned for that intersection. And then we're adding another intersection at uh, 51st. Sure. Good question, and I don't think this was abundantly clear in the staff report. So you're correct, the only signal existing in the area is at 52nd and Ward. The new access point on Ward at 51st, I believe CDOT has said, can only be a right in, right out. So no left ins, no left outs. And we, we would love to see a signal um, at Ridge and Ward. Uh, so far, CDOT has um, not been amenable to that because of the spacing requirements that they have for state highways. The signal would be too close to 52nd and also too close to the at-grade railroad crossing where the heavy rail crosses Ward Road. Um, do you have anything to add to that? We're, we're also, per CDOT's request, going to be changing the access at Ridge Road to be what's called a three-quarter movement. So there's a right in, a right out, and a left in but no left out allowed at Ridge. So that'll be some work we'll be doing this summer. We'll be reaching out to the folks that have businesses along Ridge to inform them of that um, really soon. We just got a set of plans from our consultant to, to, that shows that. So um, there will be a change at Ridge Road in that regard. We'd love to have a signal there, as, as Lauren said, but um, they've said no at this point. Yeah, and that's a, that's a requirement for CDOT, an acknowledgement of the changing traffic patterns. Um, anytime a land use change is significant enough to change the traffic patterns, they have the jurisdiction to tell um, cities or private property owners that the access has to change. Thank you. Yep. Could I, could I do a quick follow-up? Sure. I just need to, so <clears throat> you can't take a left out of 51st Avenue and, you, and eventually you can't take a left off Ridge Road? That's correct. So 
What if I want to go to Kaiser? So if you want to go left, you'd have two options from this area. One is to go up to 52nd and turn left there. The other option, depending on where you're going and what 52nd looks like, would be to drive over to Tabor Street, take Tabor Street south to the I-70 Furnage Road north, and then take that over to Ward Road. That's a, also a signalized intersection. So those are the two places that would allow um, you know, full movements at 52nd and at, at, um, at uh, the Frontage Road. So, so are you going to issue instructions on how to, how to get in and out of this place? Well, I think we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna try really hard to let the folks that, that, live, that work right along Ridge know this change because they're the ones most directly affected, and, and we think everyone else is going to figure it out really quickly. <laughs> yeah. I just have a question mostly because I'm not familiar with CDOT rules, but you said it was, what was their reason for limiting having a signal there? So, so this, is, this is considered a NRA, a non-rural, they just have rural, non-rural, a non-rural um, arterial for them, and their pre preferred spacing is half mile. They will allow signals at a one quarter mile spacing, and this is closer than that. If Ridge intersected really close to the tracks, we'd be at that one quarter mile spacing. So that's one issue for them. The other issue is that Ridge is, is not a good distance away from the railroad tracks. If Ridge was right up against the tracks, then we could probably get a signal because it'd, it'd be like many of the other crossings where the Ridge Road is right against the tracks and so you can coordinate both the train movements and those, the street movements. It's, it's sort of at that sweet spot where it's far enough away that they're concerned if we put a signal there, people going north will block the tracks and then a train will come along and hit somebody or or because you can't stop freight trains. They don't stop in time to, to not hit people. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's the concern um, is that, that we don't, it's not in a good position either for 52nd or for the railroad tracks. Okay, so volume isn't part of the criteria. I mean, I think that's a valid so, concern. So they yeah, have, so, so you, step one is does it meet spacing criteria and then step two for them does it meet warrants does it have the number of cars during certain times of day to 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 hit that but their step one is spacing criteria thank you yeah Mr. Voss. i had one question um re, uh, page five parkland dedication last line first paragraph reduced fee why reduced and the fee that you quote, $2,021.62 per unit, reflects on the housing unit? Um, so it's assessed per housing unit. The fee, <clears throat> when, when the subdivision regulations and the parkland dedication requirements were amended maybe six or seven years ago, um, we didn't have a calculation in the code. We sort of had wishy-washy language about assessing the value of land, and there was a lot of inconsistency in how the fee was assessed. There were frequent waivers made. Um, so we did, we did um, two strict calculations. One, we said, what's our industry standard? That's the seven and a half acres per thousand people. And then we did a little bit of a fee study of, um, so if that's the, if the acreage calculation, what's the land value going to be? And the land value, I believe, is like $3.63 per square foot. Um, and then we did a study on um, household size so that we could make this the per person calculation. All that to say, we ended up with four categories, sort of the generic um, parkland fee and lieu, I believe a senior category, an urban um, renewal area category, and a transit-oriented development so that higher density projects where we wanted to have density were not um, disproportionately... Uh, um, assess this fee compared to sort of a standard residential neighborhood. So those numbers are all codified in the subdivision regulations, um, and that's the set fee per unit so that there's no surprises when you come in to say, I think I want to develop, we can tell you that up front instead of you negotiating your fee at council at the very end. And then the word reduced, how does that relate? Um, so the fee, the unit fee, that 2021 fee is less than it is sort of in the middle of the city for a, uh, for a fee that if you're not in the URA, if you're not by transit, if you're not senior. So it's, it's the least of the others. I think the, the highest fee is almost $2,500 per unit. Does that sound right? Yeah. 
So the reducing is not describing that they're getting a 50% discount, it's just describing within the other parkland? Correct, yes, okay. among the four different categories, it's the, the least. All right, and then maybe on another study uh, before commissioners, we have traffic questions and building out in several phases and the infrastructure cost, will that be at other I'm meetings? Sorry. What's the question? Uh, I have three, traffic concerns and is this being built out in several phases over how many years? And what about the infrastructure cost? Who's? Um, so it, it is proposed to be phased and the subdivision improvement agreement would memorialize what those phases would be and what infrastructure has to be in place as, before you start a phase or before you end a phase. Um, the timing, my, you could maybe ask the applicant, the timing is gonna be based on the absorption in the market, how quickly they sell the units. Okay. Um, I don't know what the cost of the infrastructure is. And what was the third? Uh, traffic. Uh, we reviewed a traffic study. Um, did you have a specific question about the traffic study? There was a traffic yes. study. And yes. will we be presented with those results at when? Um, the traffic study is part of the case file and has resulted in the requirement of the infrastructure that you saw presented tonight. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Commissioner Liu. Yeah, I just wanted to clarify uh, the community outreach. You said there was no objection. There were no, no one had any issues, problems with it. Um, that that's correct? correct. So there's no neighborhood meeting requirement for subdivision plat. Um, we had a neighborhood meeting required for the concept plan, one of the other related documents that was maybe about a year ago. Um, prior to any public hearing, we send letters and post signs. Uh, we receive one inquiry, no written objections. Um, sort of separate from this specific application, we've been doing a lot of infrastructure planning, as I mentioned. We've had several property owner meetings um, for roadway projects that the city is doing. We've, we've given updates on developments. Um, we haven't... I think a lot of folks have sort of known some of these are coming, so we haven't gotten a lot of comments recently. Okay, thank you. Um, what percent is single-use residential for the project? I'm sorry, what was What What percent is single-use residential? I don't know the percentage off the top of my head, but 200 out of the 201 units. Um, I mean, the right-of-way dedication is three and a half acres. Those parks are three quarters of an acre, so... Um, Obviously, the vast majority, but I don't know the, the total. Okay, thank you. Are there any other questions for staff? Thank you. Yes. Let's hear from the applicant if the applicant has a presentation. If, if Otherwise, if you don't have a presentation, we just have the commissioners ask you questions. Sure. No, I'm, I'm Greg Sale with uh, representing Toll Brothers, and... Um, I don't have a presentation. I think Lauren covered it pretty well. Um, but if you, I, do you have any questions for us, I'd be happy to answer them. Do any of the commissioners have any questions? No? Thank you. Right, thank you. Okay, let's move on to the citizens forum. Are there any citizens that have signed up to speak? Lauren's working on it. Thank you. This looks like we have five people signed up. Um, I'll start with this list first, and if there's anybody that hasn't signed up, then uh, I'll ask you to come forward. So, uh, an Annie Bruner, did you want to come forward? No? Okay. Megan Marquis. Okay, thank you. Mon, uh, Monty Druliner. Yeah, okay. Tom Bear. Please come forward and state your name and address. I'm uh, Tom Beyer, or the address. I own the property uh, on the south side of Ridge Road from the development. It's uh, 12,200 Ridge Road. Thank you. Um, 
my concerns and some of it's a question at the neighborhood meeting that we had had before um, there was uh, the issue of uh, parking at that time and I don't know if it made it into the final submittal but they were talking about a possible waiver of the number of parking spaces they had to provide for 200 units and if I'm not mistaken the standard or the city of Wheat Ridge uh, requires two and a half parking spaces per unit but they were considering giving them a waiver for two spots per unit and I'm curious to see if it, was that included in the submittal for that waiver for parking or is uh, has that been addressed in the in the plan how about how about we'll um I'll have you address the commission. I'll, I'll take down your questions. Then after everybody's spoken, we'll get those. I'll, I'm writing them down. We'll get back to that. Okay. So they won't. They well, won't. my concern, of course, is if, if we, it's not just the parking, but it's the access and the, uh, the road. Uh, I'm very familiar with the road. I've been there for 25 years. Um, a couple of things. I know they're going to widen the road, uh, but if they allow on-street parking, we're basically going to widen the road, but then allow people to, to park on it, which is going to leave us back where we are right now. Uh, it's an industrial area, and every business along there has uh, traffic in and out of that area. And my experience has been when you have people parking on the street, they inevitably encroach on our entrances to our businesses. And, and that's a major problem. I'm a landscaper and I, you know, we have trucks and heavy equipment. Uh, there's an excavating contractor in there. Apache Steel gets regular deliveries on a daily basis with semi trucks. The boat store down the street, they have people coming in all the time. Um, I, 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 I'm not specifically opposed to parking on the whole street, but on our side of the street, I think it's it's gonna it's gonna affect us quite a bit, especially with all the new traffic coming into the uh, the RTD station. There's going to be times a day, uh, especially during rush hour, where it's it's just going to be a, a major problem. Um, so I would encourage you, number one, if there is a uh, an issue with giving them a waiver on parking, a half a space on 200 units is 100 parking spaces. And if you give them a waiver and someone in, on the council or the planning commission mentioned that, you know, 200 units, three people, uh, you're probably going to have at least three cars, which means they're going to need additional parking. But if the builder is not required to have that, you're talking about 100 possibly spaces with people parking their RVs and uh, motorcycle trailers, uh, boats. Uh, it won't just affect me, it's also going to clog up the, uh, the light rails parking lot. If I'm not mistaken, there's 250 spaces there, but on any given day, uh, you could have people parking there that live in this, uh, that live in this subdivision. So I, th I think it's going to put a strain on, the, on our neighborhood, um, and eventually I'm sure the property I own is going to be redeveloped. I have no intention of doing that anytime soon. I'm running an operating business, but it's, uh, I think the traffic and then the access for us is going to be affected. Plus, I just am sort of philosophically, I realize that some of my property is going to be taken away and used for a road. I, I've come to grips with that and I'm not opposed to it if, if it's for access for the RTD, bike lane, pedestrian, but to take property from me that I use for my employees parking just so that we can allow the developer then to, uh, to have his uh, customers park where I'm now able to park, uh, it just doesn't make sense to me. Um, so I, I, I think either uh, if, if we can eliminate a waiver and make sure they provide enough parking for, for uh, you know, the new owners of those homes, um, that, that would go a long way to making me feel better about this. I, I'm not opposed to the development of the property, but we need to be sensible. Um, you also got to consider that 
any traffic studies that have been done to this point just aren't realistic. Ridge Road uh, wasn't even open until just a couple of months ago, uh, so you couldn't get an accurate gauge of the traffic going on it. And then also, we really don't know how much use the light rail is going to get at this point. So access and parking is going to be a real issue. Uh, and I think it's a very important issue as I look at the plan. It's going to be a pretty high density uh, situation and, and uh, to eliminate a hundred parking spaces. Uh, I might suggest that the developer uh, reduce the number of units that are going to be on that property, uh, which would free up space to build a, a secondary parking lot for their residents. That might also go somewhat to address the concerns of the parkland. If you have fewer people, fewer units, then that formula of uh, 600, you know, seven acres or seven and a half acres for every 600 people, if you reduce the number of people, uh, they could build a larger parking lot and it also would put less pressure on the parkland that they're going to create. Um, yeah. My other concern about this that I just found out about tonight is the, uh, this gentleman over here said they were going to notify us landowners about uh, no left turn out of Ridge Road. I've been, before I owned the property there, I rented there, so I've been on that street for 34 years. And um, while it's no fun getting out on Ward Road to, to tell us now that we aren't going to be able to make left turns from our businesses and our customers, uh, I understand the problem, but um, I, I think maybe that is something to consider in this too. I, I mean, my, where I go, I never turn right and go north. I'm always headed for I-70 where I can go to work every day. So um, it would have been nice to have, uh, he said he was going to let us business owners know in the near future. It sure would have been nice to have had that on the agenda uh, tonight, too. So, Thank you, sir. Thank you. Okay, the next one is Fred Orr. Uh, my name's Fred Orr. I'm 5040 Acoma Street, Denver, Colorado, 80216. Um, I own two of the Can industrial... Can you repeat the address, please? Pardon me? Can you repeat the address? Uh, 5040 Acoma, A-C-O-M-A, Street, Denver, 80216. Okay. <clears throat> Um, I own two of the industrial buildings adjacent to the property on the north side. And I brought this up before. We have to lift our sewer up to 52nd. And we've talked to Fruitdale about it, but it would be good planning just for the area and infrastructure to accommodate that that infrastructure could flow. It would actually gravity flow into a line going into this project. And I just would want to be on record that that would just be even good planning for the area, even in the future, to accommodate sewer to come from there instead of lifting it into 52nd. Thank you. Is there any other questions or comments? No, nope, I just wanted to make sure that everybody was aware of that. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Are there any other persons that have not signed up to speak that wish to come forward? My name is Sean Baker at 5040 Ward Road. I'm at the corner of where there'll be just a right turn in only there. And uh, my, my concern would be um, when Jolly Rancher was operating, uh, when people wanted to go south along Ward Road, they would cut through our property on a consistent basis when there was a backup of Ward Road. It kind of does seem uh, like we need to have some more consideration on the left out there. So, is that a possibility? Because we don't remember, no one remember. I've been there 35 years, so I, I remember that, but not too many people are considering that turnout. So, and there's really no way to prevent that. I don't know, do you have any thoughts, Mark? So you're wanting, are you wanting a, a left turn on, off a of Ridge Road? Well, I really think we need to continue having a left, left turn from Ridge towards southbound. 
And that may, that portion of the roadway need, may need to be widened further at that point. So, because I think it's going to be a bottleneck. I think it's going to impact his business and it's going to impact my, my business too. So, but my other concern is the shortcutting across the lot. You know, so that creates a safety issue. So, anyway, that's my only comment. Thank you. Thanks. Is there anybody else that wishes to come forward? Seeing none, I will close the citizens' forum. And let's go through these questions. Um, so the first one is going to be on the parking space requirement. Sure. Is so um, parking lot or parking design is a, is a site planning um, issue. There is a minimum and a maximum for parking in any mixed use zone district. Um, so there's not a waiver that's given, and certainly I can um, connect with Mr. Byer to show him the site plan that we've been working on, or anybody else that would be interested. Um, as it relates to the subdivision plot, I can tell you that the internal right-of-way dedications, as well as the dedication on Ridge, will accommodate enough on-street parking to add 94 spaces. Um, so we're very conscious about making sure all of those new streets and widened streets would provide as much parking as, as we could. Um, there's no plan to add curb, gutter, sidewalk, or bikes on the south side of Ridge. There's a, there's a, yeah, there's a bike lane existing today on the south side of Ridge, and there's no changes proposed to that south side until those, south, those properties on the south side redevelop. So there would not be any parking allowed on the south side of Ridge Road. Okay, and then what about uh, garages? Does that go into account for parking space requirements um, so so site planning issue I can you know I can tell you that the, all the townhomes are planned to have garages so they would have on street or off street parking rather um, I don't have that number off the top of my head okay and then um, uh, RVs boats um, are those allowed on the street and for how long by city code yes by city code no, um, you can request a two-week permit to park an operable and licensed trailer on City Street. We probably process two of those a year, um, but only uh, re uh, traditional vehicles are allowed to be parked on the City Street. And then I'd like to hear from the applicant um, whether they, if that's something that the HOA is going to be permitting that might shed some light on it. Do I need my name and address? Yeah, uh, Matt Foran. I live at um, 2753 East 139th Drive in Thornton, Colorado. Um, so with the HOA, I, I, I can't imagine because of the site and the layout and the, the amount of spaces that are available that trailers, RVs, this type of development probably wouldn't warrant that a lot of the people would own a lot of trailers and RVs. I don't see a lot of uh, an issue with that. I don't, I can't speak to the HOA documents exactly, but I'll have to review those. Okay, thank you. Um, and then there's a question about the notification of no left turns for adjacent property owners. Yeah, so sorry to spring that on our bite tonight because um, uh, we're gonna we're putting together a letter that explains all this. When when Ridge Road was the dead end street, um, then it was fine with having a full movement access there. With the with the street being punched through all the way to Tabor, um, and also with the the sort of the the influx of the traffic from the from the RTD lot and and the station, um, CDOT determined that there would be no left outs allowed. That was not anything the city had any discretion on at all. It was not as a result of this this development that's being proposed tonight, that's talked about tonight. It was all due to um, just the area changing because of, of Ridge Road connecting through and, and the station being there. Thank you. And then uh, there's another qu a question about the uh, a sewer line coming from the north and gravity fed tying into the project. I think that's a great idea. We can certainly talk about that with the, the developer and with Fruitdale to see if that's something that can be accommodated. Um, I'm not sure, I, I know we've met Mr. Orr before, but I'm not sure if he's the west two buildings or the east two buildings. White roof. 
Okay. So. Um, yeah. Yeah. So, so I, I, it's something we could certainly explore. It's not something the city would get terribly involved in. I would hope the sanitation district would see the value of not having lift stations there anymore, but, but we'll have to, okay. So somebody else is walking up that here. knows more than I do. Yeah. Uh, Tom Odell from CVL, um, 10333 East Dry Creek Road. Um, yeah, in our construction drawing design, Union Court would have a sanitary line in it along with a storm line in it. Also an alleyway just west of that parcel would also have a sanitary available if the future developed and needed a connection point for it. Thank you. And then I think we've, there's a question about, uh, a comment about that wanting a left on Ridge Road. And I, I know we've kind of already addressed that with the traffic light and CDOT. Yeah, the, the left on Ridge Road just is not going to be off of Ridge Road. It's just not going to be allowed anymore by CDOT. Um, when they look at all these access points and everything that's going on there, um, they just don't think that's a safe movement. Thank you. Are there any other uh, questions from planning commissioners? Just a, a quick question about the parking. There's no, there's, it doesn't look to me like you can squeeze in visitor parking anywhere. Right? A few of the tracks will be able to accommodate parking. Yes. And is parking, parking will not be allowed on 51st and Vivian? All of the interior streets will have on street parking, including 51st and Vivian. Yes. Okay. Yes. Is it, okay. Any other questions from the commission? Go ahead. What, um, how is uh, CDOT not going to allow a left-hand turn off a ridge road? How does that happen? Um, access onto state highways are solely at CDOT's discretion. With the change that happened to Ridge Road with no longer being a dead-end street, we actually had to um, go apply for a permit for Ridge Road, an updated permit for Ridge Road. And so as a part of that permit review, they determined that given the potential traffic patterns and the things that are going on, we provide them a traffic study. Um, they determined that a left turn out of Ridge Road would no longer be allowed. It's not something the city, we talked with them about it and they said this is the way it's going to be and that, that's at their sole discretion of, of what is allowed onto their state highways. So they're the way that they'll enforce that is they're requiring the city at the city's expense to build a median or a pork chop that would physically prohibit the turn. Oh, okay. Yeah. Got it. Thank oh, you. Sorry. Mm -hmm. Thanks for the questions. Yes, go. Yeah, and uh, related to that, um, are the businesses along Wood Road, on the east side of Wood Road, when people come out of those businesses, are they permitted to make left turns? Yes, those will still be full access points for those folks today. Um, it may be at some point in the future, see, that decides that won't be allowed, and they may decide to build a median along Ward Road. Um, which is at their full discretion to do. So, so for today, yeah, so you know, the, the folks coming in out of the lumber company down there, um, compared to the potential number of folks that might come in out of Ridge Road is pretty small. So they'll probably continue to allow that left turn access. Well, that, what I'm thinking is, is there access to any of those businesses from Ridge Road where people would wind through those businesses' parking lots in order to be able to make the left turn? Just, just the business at the corner, which is the gentleman that was here tonight, owns that, that property. Um, and certainly people might try to snake through his property to get out there to do a left turn. Um, my feeling is most people are gonna figure out it's really hard to turn left on the Ward Road any time of day. They're gonna go to one of the signals at either 52nd or the Friends Road to turn left. When I'm up in that neighborhood, I don't go to Ward Road and try to turn left. I go ahead and snake around and, and get to one of the signals. Would CDOT have any ability to allow left turns at certain times of the day, or is that all day long? That, that it would be very hard to regulate that. I mean, you put up a sign that says left turns only allowed then, and people are going to ignore it. So we're actually going to put a, a physical thing on Ridge Road that will discourage people from going left. Certainly people that want to you know, if it's one o'clock in the morning, there's absolutely nobody on Ward Road. Someone could turn left and, and get out that way if they want to. 
Um, if a policeman happens by at the time, they'd have the discretion to pull him over and give him a ticket. But um, so the, the the world is changing up there. The the station is changing things. Access is changing. We've got a lot of construction projects changing. Um, 50 seconds is going to be a three lane road, um, hopefully by this time next year. So um, you know the way 50 second functions is going to change also. I just have one more question. <laughs> the uh, barrier that would be along Ridge uh, Ward Road, who would be responsible for that? The, the cost of that. We're, we're actually going to be um, adding a deceleration lane, so a right turn lane along Ward Road. There's enough asphalt there, we think, to just build it that way, um, so it won't impact any of those properties there. Um, and then we are going to be adding that little pork chop, if you will, that little median in the middle of the road um, at, at city expense. It's part of our, for us to have the access of Ridge Road onto Ward Road, the state highway, we have to do these improvements. Okay, thank you. Any other questions for staff or Hopkin? Yeah, just a question about Tabor south of Ridge. Is, is that an adequate road for truck traffic that can no longer turn left onto Ward Road and the, uh, to handle the fairly significant, possibly significant traffic uh, from this development? Yeah, we actually improved Tabor Street a few years ago. We got a, a, some funding from RTD, a federal grant via RTD, to improve that. And so um, Tabor Street is improved with, um, it was a very narrow two-lane road before. It's now a two-lane road still, but the lanes are wider, and we've added um, bike lanes to that and also sidewalk um, for most of that distance to the south. So we, we're, we're trying to plan ahead with that to make sure that, that connection down to the frontage road was adequate for um, the trucks that might be traveling on it. Okay, I, I don't drive around that neighborhood a whole lot. Any other questions? Okay, I would entertain a motion. I move to recommend approval of case number number WS-18-06, a request for approval of a major subdivision plat in, on property zoned mixed use commercial and located at 5060 Wood Road for the following reasons. All requirements of the subdivision regulations article four of the zoning and development code have been met all agencies can provide services to the property with improvements installed at the developer's expense with the following conditions. The applicant shall enter into a development covenant prior to recordation of the subdivision plat and subsequently into a subdivision improvement agreement. Two, prior to issuance of building permits, the applicant shall enter into a subdivision improvement agreement and shall provide homeowners association covenants for review and approval by staff three prior to issuance of building permits the applicant shall pay the required fees in lieu of parkland dedication is there a second any discussion call for a vote Motion carried seven to zero. Thank you. I'll move on to the second case. I open the public hearing for case number WZ-18-25 and WZ-18-26, an application filed by Ames Partners LLC for approval of a zone change from residential three to plan residential development with approval of an outline development plan and specific development plan for development of two duplexes located at the northeast corner of West 33rd Avenue and Ames Street. And ask for the staff report, but first I want to swear anybody in the public who plans to speak. Just hold on just a second, we're gonna close that door. <coughs> Would the applicant, staff, and anyone from the public who plans to testify or comment please stand and raise your right hand. 
If you swear to tell the truth in this matter as you know it. Thank you. And ask for the staff report. All right. Um, my name is Scott Cutler. I'm a planner with We Ridge Community Development Department. Um, and we're here tonight to hear case number WZ1825 and WZ1826, a request for approval of a zone change from residential three to a planned residential development with an outline development plan and approval of a specific development plan. Uh, I'd like to enter into the public record the contents of the case file, the zoning ordinance, the comp plan, and this digital presentation. The properties within the city of Wheat Ridge, all appropriate notification and posting requirements have been met, and therefore the Planning Commission has jurisdiction to hear the case. So noted. All right, um, so this is a 2018 aerial view of the property. Um, it's located at the extreme east end of Wheat Ridge, almost at the Denver border at the corner of 33rd Avenue and Ames Street. It's about four tenths of an acre, just a little under 19,000 square feet. It's currently vacant um, and it's about a half block from Sheridan Boulevard. Um, the surrounding area is a mix of uses. Uh, there's a three-story multifamily apartment building to the north, an assisted living facility to the east, and a small lot single family homes to the west and to the south. The zoning in the area, the site is currently zoned R3, residential three, um, as are the properties to the north, uh, south, and southwest. And R3 allows for uh, single family, duplexes, and multifamily development. Um, there's also R1C zoning to the west and south. Uh, that allows for small lot single family homes, which are there today. And NC, the zone just to the east, allows for light commercial uses, including the current use as an assisted living facility. So the plan development process, um, the applicant is proposing to develop the site with two duplexes for a total of four units, um, and the request tonight includes two components. Uh, first and foremost, the outline development plan, um, which is a rezone from residential three to planned residential development. And the ODP uh, accompanies the zone change request and establishes the development standards and the zoning on the property. Uh, and then with that, um, is a specific development plan, um, and that provides greater detail regarding the site design, landscape requirements, and building elevations. Um, and in this case, uh, they can be reviewed either concurrently or as separate documents, and the applicant has chosen to review those documents together. Um, there is also a subdivision under review that's tracking a bit behind um, these applications, and you would actually be reviewing this, that subdivision document if these uh, documents ultimately get approved by a city council. Uh, so existing conditions, um, site is currently vacant. Um, this is a view looking north um, from 33rd Avenue. Uh, you can see the existing apartment building there and then the property is to the right. Uh, there's another view, um, kind of the same view looking more northeast and you can see the assisted uh, living facility there. So we'll start with the outline development plan, uh, which establishes the zoning for the property. Um, the ODP is two sheets. Um, this is a little bit hard to read, um, but it has signature blocks, legal descriptions, and a list of development standards that I'll go over in just a minute. Um, this uh, is sheet two. It's meant to illustrate general building locations, access, general areas for drainage, um, and kind of building footprints. Uh, this is a required component of the uh, zone change process, but I'm not going to focus too much because we're also going to be reviewing the SDP, which provides a lot greater detail. Um, I did highlight the proposed lots on the property just to give you an idea of the orientation. There's a tract at the north, uh, which would end up becoming a water quality tract. And then there's two duplex lots as well. Um, and so access is to be gained from a private driveway off of 33rd Avenue on the east side. Um, and then the building's pedestrian entrances face Ames Street, which matches the surrounding context. Um, the lot widths are a little bit narrower than the R3 uh, zoning allows, um, and part of that is because we have to accommodate some drainage as it's a new development. Um, the existing setbacks, um, the front setbacks are meant to basically match the surroundings, um, as are the side setbacks along 33rd Avenue. So there's a lot going on here, but I'll try to summarize some of the development standards that are proposed and a detailed analysis is found in the staff report. 
Um, the permitted uses, the applicant has proposed duplexes, um, and in the ODP it also includes, uh, includes single family as a primary use, um, with customary accessory uses, household pets, home occupations. Um, this differs slightly from R3, which also allows attached townhomes and multifamily apartment buildings. So they're proposing to limit the uses on the property. Um, there are no architectural standards for duplexes in the city, but the applicant is proposing some additional standards for this development. Um, the R3 building height is 35 feet. The applicant is actually proposing a lowered building height of 29 feet, um, which would just accommodate a two-story construction as opposed to three stories. Um, they're proposing a smaller lot size as well. Um, duplexes in R3 require 9,000 square feet. Um, as I said before, the entire lot is about 19,000 square feet. So from an R3 standpoint, based on lot size, you could actually get two duplexes on the lot. Um, however, with the drainage, um, they actually are having to go under that requirement and are proposing a minimum lot size of 8,425 square feet. The staff report notes 8,450 square feet, um, and we actually have a recommended motion to make an edit on the ODP to change that. Um, that came up as we were doing our plat review and realized that some right-of-way dedication um, may cause one lot to be slightly under 8,450, and this is just giving us some breathing room um, to allow for that change. Uh, setbacks, front setbacks are proposed to be the same. Side setbacks are actually proposed to be a little bit larger, and rear setbacks are proposed to be a little bit smaller. Um, like I said earlier, lot width is reduced, and that is to accommodate the drainage and also to match the surrounding context. No other buildings in this area face 33rd Avenue, and the applicant expressed a desire for all the buildings to continue to face Ames Street as do the surrounding properties. Um, building coverage will remain the same, and then the applicant is actually proposing significantly increased uh, landscape requirement of a 40% for the property as opposed to a 25% that would be required by code. So moving on to the SDP, um, this is, sorry, I've lost my paper, um, gets into the details of the project, um, and I'll just go over some pertinent pages. There's actually nine sheets to the SDP, but a lot of it is repeated. Um, it does have to comply with the ODP, and the cover sheet has a table that shows the required and then the proposed conditions on the property. So this shows in uh, more detail the configuration of the site, and in this case, the position of the buildings, drainage, and driveway have not changed from the ODP. Um, the buildings have private two-car garages for each unit, um, so a total of eight on-site parking spaces, and um, both streets are sufficiently wide enough to allow for on-street parking, um, which it currently is present there today. The water quality area is located at the north of the site between the northern duplex and the apartment building. It's about 12 feet wide, and then they're proposing 56-foot wide lots for both duplexes. Um, each duplex has a private fenced yard with pathway to access the garage. Um, it can, the driveway can be accessed by residents with a cross-access easement. I um, mean, each unit will also have a front porch with a pathway to Ames Street, matching the surrounding setbacks. This is a landscape plan. We actually don't normally require landscape plans for duplexes or single-family homes in the city, but with an ODP and SDP, we do require this. Um, the applicant has proposed some enhanced landscape standards. Um, they're at about almost 42% landscape for the property. Um, city code would only require 25, so they're, they're proposing a significant increase from that. Um, four street trees are provided, and then there would be private yards that would be sod. These are the proposed elevations for the front and rear of the building. Um, the buildings are proposed to be two stories with a height of about 26 feet. Um, each unit will have a front porch and windows in the front and back, and, and it would be vertical board and batten siding. This is a side elevation. Um, the applicant has proposed a variation in the direction of the siding to make the elevation less monotonous. Again, this would not be a requirement under current city code, but they've proposed some increased standards. And then you can also see the garages are proposed to match the buildings, have low roofs that slope down to the driveway. So when you're on the driveway, that's the lowest impact point of the property. And those garages are set back about 22 feet from that eastern property line. We had a neighborhood meeting um, back in November. That is a requirement for any zone change in the city. We had two folks attend the meeting, um, and the notes are included in the staff report. 
Uh, we sent it out on a full referral since we're not a full service city and all of the outside agencies, including fire and water district, didn't have any uh, comments. Um, like I said before, the plat is still under review by uh, Public Works, but at this point, um, city departments don't have any concerns with this application. Uh, the property was also posted for 15 days prior to this hearing, and we heard from one resident who was interested in the project and provided support. Um, as any part of a zone change process, we use a few criteria to evaluate the request, and that includes consistency with a comprehensive plan. Um, a full analysis of the criteria is in the staff report. Um, this is an image showing um, this portion of the comprehensive plan, which provides guidance in terms of land use. And the property is located in uh, the brown area called neighborhood buffer. The neighborhood buffer specifically calls for improvement of underutilized properties, including a mix of residential uses. Um, staff believes this project complies with the project goals. Um, it provides uh, increased options for home ownership and it contributes to the diversity of housing that's already present in the area. Uh, we do believe the zone change request meets the criteria. It allows for a compatible and transitional land use, complies with the comprehensive plan, and provides opportunity for reinvestment. The area has long included a mix of housing types, and this project will only add to the diversity of the area. And then the SDP also meets the criteria for review. It complies with the purpose of a planned development. It is consistent with the ODP. There is adequate infrastructure to serve the property, and again, it exceeds uh, code standards for landscaping, site design, and architecture. Therefore, we are recommending approval of both requests. Um, we do have that condition, recommended condition, um, to accommodate that slightly reduced lot, minimum lot area for that southern lot to accommodate the um, potential for right-of-way dedication. Um, and then with the SDP, we recommend approval outright. Um, the applicant is here, um, able to answer questions, and I can also answer your questions at this time. Thank you. Commissioner Peterson? Um, I, I, I don't know if this qualifies as a question. This is more of an editorial comment. Um, if you go to page six, number four, letter C, um, it's about, it's about uh, criteria for changing zoning. It, letter C talks about a change in character but the argument that's made is the area has long included a mix of housing types, ages, and densities. So I suggest the condition has not been met, but it doesn't need to be because you already have a check mark in one of them. Sure, that's fair. So just an editorial change. The public record should be accurate. Thank you. <laughs> Any other questions? Commissioner Simon? Commissioner Antle, Commissioner Larson, Commissioner uh, no. Moss. Mm, possibly from staff, the <clears throat> R3 designation doesn't permit the way they want to lay out this configuration without a lot of variances from, and, th and that seems to be the only real detriment to moving it from an R3 to a PRD. That's correct, yeah. So they would have to apply for a lot width and lot size variances to do the duplexes. Interestingly, if they were developing under R3, they could develop five attached townhomes. So the way the zoning code is written, duplex lots have to be a certain size that wouldn't meet it, but it would, for some reason, allow the development of five townhomes. So they're, they're applying, instead of applying for seven variances or eight variances, they're just coming in with a plan development instead. And we're prohibited from processing lot size variances that result in additional units. So we're stuck in this weird zone where we're essentially down zoning the property, less dense, you know, um, more restrictive in terms of use architecture to allow fewer units. But it's the way that the code restricts variances to result in more units because it could today be built with two single family homes. Right, so the variances are more of a catch-22 than prohibiting any, than just the fact that somebody doesn't want to pay for variances. 
Correct. Yeah, we okay. told them they could not use the variance route to obtain the additional units. Okay. That's correct. Yeah. Thank you. Mr. Liam. Nothing. Um, I have two questions. One, does the does the landscape plan meet the streetscape standards? So the streetscape manual, um, these are local streets. Um, it requires four street trees, two on each front edge. Um, the applicant is actually going to be required to build a wider attached sidewalk and current ADA ramps at the corner. Um, so that it, that's all in the public right of way. Um, and then the only thing that the city code re would require for a local street are the street trees which are provided. Okay. And then um, I noticed that there's no sight distance triangles on the site or landscape plan. Is that a requirement or not a requirement? Um, it's not for this uh, landscape plan and also a uh, local street to local street is a 15 foot site triangle so it wouldn't even be close. Thank you. Are there any other questions for staff? Yes. Um, noted on the public meeting was a sign up sheet attached and it was not in my packet. So just bring that to your attention. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Any other questions for staff? Okay, let's hear from the, from the applicant. Thank you. If the applicant would like to come forward, um, you can make a presentation. Uh, otherwise, if you're uh, happy with the staff's presentation, some of the commissioners may okay. have some questions for you. If you could state your name and address. Uh, my name is Jay Feaster. Can you hear me? Sorry. Um, Jay Feaster, 19510. You can, ra you can raise that microphone up to you if you want. Okay. Sorry, I'm having a hard time seeing. Um, 19510 West 55th Place, Golden, Colorado, 80403. Thank you. Um, I'm, I'm actually fine with the way he descri described our project. Thank you. Commissioner Peterson? Yeah, you, you, you can answer this by saying it's none of your business, but <laughs> I'm just curious. Certainly. Um, are you thinking about one owner for the dupl for each duplex? Uh, are you thinking about two owners for each duplex? Are you thinking about two rentals for each duplex? Um, we would be conveying each each door has its own freestanding unit. We're, we kind of designed it that way to effectively be an attached single family home. Okay, but but yeah, not. yes, they'd be. Um, they'll be sold individually to different owners. Okay. Yes. Commissioners in mind? Just a quick question, <clears throat> excuse me. Sure. Um, you, you said batten siding. I just wondered why you would, you're thinking about that kind of siding. Sure, um, it's, uh, it's, it's durable. Uh, stucco was also another material that we thought about, but it just didn't seem that with the, um, we were trying to go with more of like a pitched roof um the the drawing that he put up which is just black and white i don't think quite captures it i don't know if you guys can see this at all but we were trying to come with like a cottage farmhouse pitched roof i, I printed a few of these if you'd like to see them but you know it just it seemed like it was a, a very warm friendly you know we did big front porches um you know exposed wood, wood beams on the front columns and things like that we were one of the goals of the of the architecture was uh, one to get away from the the big slot home things that Denver are, are doing, which it sound, sounds like really was kind of within the the zoning that it already had. We felt that orienting the homes back to Ames Street would would more complement the the neighborhood and whatnot. So we were we were trying. <laughs> You have another question? Go ahead. Yeah, is, is the, I, I couldn't really see that drawing. I saw the, the black and white one that we had. Is there a, a, a um, I'll refer to it as a perpendic, perpendicular gable. You've got the two front gables. Is there also a gable that goes across? There is, but, and if I show you this, because it's at an angle. Yeah. That's it, held so far back that from the street, it's going to seem like two individual pitched roofs. Okay. I was, that, that makes sense. I, I was actually more concerned about snow collecting in the thing that looks like that. No, yeah, right. No. Okay. Commissioner Antel. No, no, no. Commissioner Larson. Uh, yeah, I, I do have one question, and it gets back to parking. Um, and I, I may have missed the discussion 
I may have misinterpreted, um, but we've got a private alley uh, on the east, right? right? And that backs up to the senior center. C correct. How, how wide is the private alley is 16 feet um, I, with an apron? I, I believe so. In, in front of each individual. So it, it, there's, it, there's only one way in and out. Correct. Um, so you're not going to be able to turn around. Um, I'm, I'm wondering if, the, if there's going to be room for the folks on the north to be able to get in and out. There, there should be enough there, tur turning radius because of the side setback. Thank you. Sure. And I'm sorry. I'm... My name is uh, Jesse Donovan with Bright Lighter Engineering, 3253 North Gaylord Street, Denver, Colorado. 80205. Um, so to answer your question, on the north side, the, the city does have a five-foot backout requirement for that last unit to be able to have the car go into their, their unit, back out, and head back down to the south. Uh, currently, so we're working with Excel and uh, Comcast because currently there's a pole in the middle of the alley with a guy wire that comes to 4.1 feet. So we, we're working with them to shorten that guy wire or put a double pole. Uh, the pole is actually off of our property to the north, but the guy wire uh, comes down into the alley. So, so we will have a five-foot back-out area. It'll actually be significantly more than that to allow people to turn around and, and head back down south. Okay. Um, it, it, it just, yeah, the concern, obviously, is that you probably don't want people backing out into 33rd. Correct, yeah. yeah. And, that, and people wouldn't do that. And, and we, additionally, um, what we had is, so, you know, the, the alley, instead of putting it directly up against um, the property line, we, we set it off um, from the property line uh, three feet to the flow line. And the reason for that is because the, um, the senior center roof actually overhangs a little bit. So what we want to do is give a little bit of space so that when, we, when people do back out, 16 foot alley, people won't typically back all the way to the far side, but if they do, they'll hit a curb before backing into the building. So there is adequate space to, to give that and there was consideration given uh, for that design. Okay. Great, and, and then just one other question, just um, on uh, along 33rd Street, there is going to be um, space for parking. Correct, as there is currently. On, on street parking, correct? Correct. Yeah. Okay, okay, thank you. Mr. Voss. I have a, if I understand this correctly, um, PRD granted to you is a conceptual plan at, at this time and if we do grant this there's nothing that prohibits you from selling the property in a denser uh, development going up is that correct that's not correct okay. so um, the ODP if, if approved would establish the zoning for the property which would limit the property to either single family or duplex development and because they're showing the four unit configuration on the property, that's what they would be limited to if another person came in. Okay. And the conceptual definition defines what when it's... So the ODP is meant to be, if, if they were being reviewed separately, the ODP is meant to be a document kind of showing general footprints, general standards for development, setbacks, things like that. The SDP that we're looking at now, it provides the actual very specific standards, exactly where the houses are going to go, exactly where all of the setbacks are going to be. But if they went away and don't develop under the SDP, the ODP still applies with all of those standards, including the limit on units. Thank you. Mr. Leo. Oh, I have a concern, and I don't know if this is the right time or not, but... Um, duplexes tend to, not always, but tend to be non-owner occupied. They're purchased and then they are rented out. And that's just a concern I have because we have so many rentals in Wheat Ridge as it is. Sure. I just want to throw that out. It's okay. The, um, so we've done, um, uh, in varying, varying different builders and varying different owners, um, I would say maybe 
45 duplexes in eight years. Um, and I've been the real estate broker on all of them. And I have yet to see one that didn't uh, close with a loan that wasn't an owner occupying loan. Um, I think that the big difference is, is that there, there may be uh, a variety of duplexes in Wheat Ridge, but there probably aren't the scale of, of these. I mean, these aren't near the scale as some of the Denver ones uh, that you've seen. Um, you know, they're under 2,000 square feet above ground, so, but they're three bed, two and a half bath. You know, they're, they're built for, for a family, so. Okay, thank you. But, but I couldn't, I, when I sell it to somebody, I, I wouldn't know yeah. what, what they would use it for, so. And just for the record, city code and federal fair housing laws wouldn't allow us to regulate or distinguish or make any sort of judgment on whether they could be owner or renter occupied. Right. Well, that's why I said it was a concern. Sure. Fair enough. <laughs> I, I have a couple questions. One is, um, what is the purpose of the small fence on the north and south? Uh, it's got two gates. Is that for, like, emergency egress out of the... Can you help me? I'm sorry, I can't. My vision is so bad right now. Can you be more specific about which fence you're talking about? You're asking about the there's, fences? Yeah, there's one on the north and there's one on the south that they kind of, um, yeah, they have those. Fence? Yep, so these yep. Are, are the private yard fences. So um, there's a fence down the middle and yeah. then this is a fence. Yeah, but what is the, I don't, I mean, typically I see fences um, like connecting corner to corner of the house or a corner of the garage to corner of the house. This one juts out like I guess five feet is that I'm just curious why I think one of the intentions was to try to uh, maximize the visual space in between the units okay. and so by kind of putting the fence back along the back edge of the property it would kind of visually give more space between the units okay. but yeah. still allow you know kids and dogs to be in the backyard yeah I didn't know if that was like a emergency egress that you needed to have a gate or something if that was the, the situation but um, That's right. In addition, on, on uh, lot one to the north side, tract A is the water quality pond that we briefly talked about. It slopes up to the up to the building, so part of the the lot one that's adjacent to it is it's not you know usable. Not that it's not usable, but it's it's sloped a little bit more. So this the backyard fence, as shown, kind of in, encapsulates the flat usable um, backyard space uh, for grilling patio that type of stuff, and then. You know, there's a little bit of a grade drop off along the north side of lot one, so that's okay. why it wasn't included. Okay, thank you. And then the other question I have, um, I noticed on the the east side of the garage is next to the alley that the dimension of the sidewalk is 4.8 feet, uh, which is not standard. Usually, I see like a five foot width sidewalk. I was just curious why the 4.8. You can see you can see it on it. On the east side of the garages? Yeah, it says concrete and there's so that's, a... That's actually not a sidewalk. That is just a, an approach to the garages. So okay. you have an alley and then um, off of that, there's a slope up to, to hit the finished floor of the garage. It's, it's not... Um, it's, okay. It doesn't connect. So in this area between the two, there is no concrete in this area. It doesn't connect. So okay. it's just a driveway apron. Thank you. I have no further questions. Any other staff? Well, Commissioner Peterson? This probably falls into the category of we can't make you do anything. But you've got a concrete patio and a walkway out to the garage. Um, the city of Wheat Ridge doesn't have any requirements for permeable patios and walkways and things like that, did it? Sorry, trying to get the mic on. Um, so we do have requirements for open space on properties. Um, the code for duplexes just requires 25% of the lot. Um, the applicant is actually proposing 42% of the lot. So um, they've, they've proposed a much more increased, um, I guess, amount for each lot um, of, it, of open space, which in this case is mostly pervious with the exception of the concrete patios. I think we're open to per pervious pavers and things like that, but um, they're well exceeding their requirement. No, no, I, yeah, it's, it's clear from the diagrams that they're exceeding that. I was just wondering about permeable materials. 
It's certainly encouraged, yeah. Encouraged, but not required. It's permeable pavers are allowed as a part of your water quality treatment. If you chose to go down that path, they've got a separate water quality facility. That's just an above ground facility. Um, those permeable painters have pretty high maintenance requirements. Um, and so we typically don't see it on a lot that's got the room to put in a water quality pond like this one does. Um, but we certainly have them at locations around the city, but. Okay. Commissioner, Commissioner Larson. Yeah, just real quickly. Um, do the do each one of these units do they have basements or is it a? a uh, they will have basements. They'll be unfinished. We'll put mechanical rooms down there. Um, storage. Height. Um, nine foot ceiling height. Okay, and uh, separate egress or, or is it uh, just a just, just a, a basement? It's just a basement. Okay. Uh, there will be uh, egress windows uh, for the what I guess could be future bedroom. I, okay. I guess. Okay, thank but, yeah. you. Any other questions for the applicant? Okay, I'll move on to the citizens forum. Thank you. Are there any citizens that have signed up to speak? Give me just one minute. We're, we're, okay. we're uh, done with you for now. Thank you. Thanks. Okay, I have four people signed up. Um, the first one is Tom Sunheim. If you want to come forward and state your name and address. My name is Tom Sunheim. I live at uh, 5601 West 35th Avenue. So I'm about three blocks from the, this uh, proposed project. And uh, I came as a pessimist only in that I was armed for 45th and Tennyson being snuck into the neighborhood. And I was absolutely pleased to speak with the gentleman uh, who's uh, the real estate broker. Uh, not only his attitude, but what they're proposing, I think they're knocking themselves out to do a really, really great project for the little neighborhood. I, I don't personally see, I think they've uh, done all their due diligence with not doing a flat roof and all the due diligence, not going from sidewalk to alley to street. Their landscape uh, proposal is great. <clears throat> Their garages is a good idea. And uh, uh, sidewalks, I'm going to guess that's uh, a lot uh, in the, the hands of Wheat Ridge to do because the neighborhood's pretty funky in sidewalk world. But other than that, I, I think it's a wonderful proposal. I hope you folks see it in the same light. And I don't, I don't see where it's anything but a good thing for that, that part of our neighborhood. Thank you. Thank you. The next is George Della Giacomo. Thank you. Uh, Jay Fiester. Oh, okay. Uh, Jesse Donovan. Okay. Um, are there any other people in the audience that wish to come forward and speak? I will, if not, I will close the citizens forum. So we have no questions for staff. Are there any other questions from the commissioners to staff or the applicant? At this point, I would entertain a motion. Can I make a comment to the applicant sure. before motion? I just wanted to say to the applicant in agreement with um, Tom, that I really appreciate the less density, the architect of what's proposed, and the fitting in with the neighborhood, the character of what is already there. We see too much of uh, not that happening, and um, I just wanted to say I appreciate the thoughtfulness of that. Thank you. So the first one will be a motion for the zone change ODP. We've, we've, sir, we've closed the citizens forum and we're... And I don't mean to be rude, but I wanted to thank Mrs. Voss for your question that you spoke to, which was exactly answering the question, do we come in and make a, a change and then make it a different project? I thought that was a very prudent question. Thank you very much. And excuse me, I'm sorry. Thank you, sir. So is there a motion? Mr. Chairman, I'll, I'll make a motion. 
And I move to recommend approval of case number WZ1825, a request for approval of a zone change from residential three to plan residential development with an outline development plan for a property located at the northeast corner of West 33rd Avenue and Ames Street for the following reasons. One, the proposed zone change will promote the public health, safety, and welfare of the community and does not result in an adverse effect on the surrounding area. Two, the proposed zone change is consistent with the goals and objective of the city's comprehensive plan. Three, the proposed zoning is consistent with the intent of a plan development compatible with surrounding land uses and will, will result in a high quality development. And four, the criteria used to evaluate a zone change support the, 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 I'm sorry, the criteria used to evaluate a zone change support the request. I have a second. I may respectfully request um, consideration of our recommended condition that's on the screen as well. Uh, and uh, I'd like to add that uh, the staff recommends approval with condition. A minimum lot area shall be revised to 8,425 square feet. Is there a second? Any discussion? Call for a vote. Motion carried seven to zero. Thank you. Okay. Second motion. No. What's oh, it? yes. SB. Yes, yes. Um, Okay, I would now entertain a motion for the S specific development plan. I'll, I'll move to recommend approval. I move to recommend approval of case number WS1826, a request for approval of a specific development plan on property located at the northeast corner of West 33rd Avenue and Ames Street for the following reasons. The specific de development plan is consistent with the purpose of a plan development as stated in section 26-301 of the city code. The specific development plan is consistent with the intent and purpose of the outline development plan. The proposed uses are consistent with those approved by the outline development plan. All responding agencies have indicated they can serve the property with improvements installed at the developer's expense. And finally, the specific development plan is in substantial compliance with the applicable standards set forth in the outline development plan and the city's adopted codes and policies. Do we need to add that a sixth condition? What's up on the screen or is that just for the ODP? That was just for the ODP. Okay, thank you. Is there a second? Any discussion? Call for vote. Motion carried seven to zero. Okay, we will now move on to our third and final case. I open the public hearing for case number WZ-18-23, an application filed by Regency Centers for approval of master sign plan for Applewood Village Shopping Center on property zone plan commercial development at the northeast corner of the property located at 3210 to 3600 Youngfield Street. Um, and before I ask for the staff report, I just want to swear anybody in who plans to speak, including the applicant, staff, and anyone from the public who plans to test testify. If you could raise your right hand, do you swear to tell the truth in the matter as you know it? And ask for the staff report. All right, I'm back. Um, we're here uh, to hear case number WZ1823, which is a request for approval of a master sign plan at Applewood Village Shopping Center, which is located at 3210 to 3600 Youngfield Street. I'd like to enter into the public record the contents of the case file, the zoning ordinance, and this digital presentation. The property is within the city of Wheat Ridge. All appropriate notification and posting requirements have been met. And therefore, Planning Commission has jurisdiction to hear the case. So noted. 
All right, uh, Applewood Shopping Center is located at the west side of Wheat Ridge um, between 32nd Avenue and 38th Avenue along Youngfield Street. Uh, it's approximately 34 and a half acres. Uh, it takes up six city blocks um, and it is a really large part of the west side of the city. Um, surrounding uses, um, some residential to the east um, behind the shopping center along Wright Street, um, residential and commercial to the south, and then I-70 is to the west. This is a map of the zoning. Um, the entire property is zoned planned commercial development. Um, that was approved as an outline development plan, I believe in 2012, uh, but the shopping center has been around since the late 60s. Um, and then zoning to the east uh, is residential. Zoning to the south is also mostly commercial with some residential uh, east of Xenon Street. Um, I just want to provide some photos. Um, there is a lot going on at Applewood right now. Um, there's a new restaurant under construction and then the entire north side of the shopping center is being renovated. The former Walmart building is being repurposed. Um, so this is a shot looking north on Youngfield Street. Um, you can see the, one of the existing freestanding signs kind of behind this Regency Center sign. Um, that is a current freestanding sign in the property. Um, and then you can see I-70 to the west. Um, and, and just for perspective, this is half the halfway point of the shopping center. And it slopes down a little bit, but you can't see 38th Avenue from here. So th that just gives you an idea of the scale. Um, this is uh, at the entrance on 32nd Avenue looking east. I think in the staff report I wrote west, but it's east. Um, and the King Supers fueling station is to the left of this image. So uh, master sign plan um, is a plan that establishes standards for the size, location, and design of uh, signage within a unified development or a campus. There are a few examples of master sign plans in the city of Wheat Ridge. Um, Applewood does not have one currently, um, so this is an application for a new master sign plan for the property. Uh, but Lutheran Hospital, uh, the corners at Wheat Ridge are two primary examples of properties that have master sign plan. Um, they're meant to encourage well-planned and well-designed unified signage for a large property while still allowing for identification of businesses. Um, so it can propose minimum and maximum standards. It's allowed to vary from the sign code um, that's established by our city code. Uh, but it does not change the zoning. It does not change permitted uses. It does not involve a site plan review and, and it does not involve architectural design of buildings. So it's specifically focused on which signs are potentially changing standards. Um, so it's approved by Planning Commission. Um, this is the final hearing for this application and it's recorded with Jefferson County. Not all properties are eligible for a master sign plan. Um, they must be at least two acres in size. Applewood is 34 and a half and they have to be under, under unified control. Um, in this case, Applewood is operated by Regency Centers. So checks both those boxes. The applicant is uh, proposing a few things. Um, first, they're proposing um, four freestanding signs on the property with cohesive branding for the shopping center. Uh, currently, there is one freestanding sign on the property that is a multi-tenant sign at the main entrance. There was also a freestanding sign that was formerly used by Walmart, um, which is now still there on the property, um, and that's also proposed to be replaced. Uh, but there's no signs on either 32nd or 38th Avenue. Um, under the sign code, they would be permitted signs on those streets, and actually the shopping center could have up to seven 50-foot tall signs on the property under the sign code if it was not part of a planned development. Um, in this case, they're proposing four signs. Um, one 50-foot tall primary multi-tenant sign, which is meant to replace the current sign that I showed you, uh, that replace that sign on that image. Um, they're proposing a 30-foot secondary sign um, to replace the former Walmart sign. Uh, and then there's proposing two uh, tertiary signs, um, both 10 feet tall, one on 38th Avenue at the new entrance to the uh, redevelopment area, and then one adjacent to the King Supers fueling station, which would allow small allowance for fuel prices. And I'll show you the elevations in just a second. Um, they would also prohibit any new single tenant freestanding signs. Um, so a sign for one tenant would no longer be allowed um, unless it's already on the property. Um, and there's also a private tenant landlord agreement for existing non-conforming signs. So they proposed four signs. Um, 
The largest lot in the shopping center, um, there's six lots there. It makes up 83% of the site, but would be limited to only two freestanding signs. Um, and just the way it's arranged where the lots are, the, the lot lines don't necessarily translate to good locations for signs, so that's why they're proposing them in the locations I'll show you in just a second. Um, so these are the locations of the proposed signs. Like I said, um, centered on Youngfield Street, um, the two, the 50-foot sign and the 30-foot sign would replace the existing signs. Then we've got a new sign proposed on 38th Avenue, which currently does not exist. That would be a 10-foot sign. And then another sign proposed on the right side of this image, which would be on the south side on 32nd Avenue, also proposed to be 10 feet. Um, so sign plans allow some flexibility in the final locations, provided that all minimum setbacks are met. Other standards, such as height, square footage, and illumination are firm. Um, and I said, as I said before, um, the two signs on Youngfield re would replace the existing signs. Um, there are proposed setbacks, um, which are outlined in the staff report, but the primary multi-tenant sign is proposed to have a 15-foot setback from the right-of-way line. Um, the 30-foot sign is proposed to have a one-foot setback minimum from the property line. And then the two tertiary signs are proposed to be set back five feet. Um, there were some questions asked about sight triangles um, for these signs. So sight triangles don't apply at signalized intersections. And this sign is also proposed to be located. Um, currently, it's located in a median. There are potential to potentially uh, redo how this intersection looks. But still, signalized intersections, both this and this, sight triangles do not apply. Um, but they would apply to these signs. Um, the 30-foot thir the sign is proposed to be on the north side of this axis drive, so it wouldn't actually obstruct views of oncoming traffic. And the final location of all signs would need to be approved by Public Works through a building permit, um, and they look at sight distance on that sign. So there is some flexibility on the final location, particularly of this sign. Um, as you can see, this shows a future out parcel. It's currently an RTD transfer station, um, but RTD is potentially going to move across the highway and then open this uh, parcel up for redevelopment. So the final location of this sign is really based on um, what this final configuration looks like. As long as it meets the minimum setbacks and meets the site triangle requirements um, and site distance according to Public Works, it could be approvable. Um, so these are the proposed elevations of the signs. Um, the current site code allows freestanding signs up to 400 square feet, um, but it permits the Planning Commission to approve up uh, to a 50% increase per sign or up to 600 square feet. And as you can see, the applicant has proposed a 596 square foot sign for this 50 foot sign. Um, but in return, they've also proposed the other signs to be both shorter and much smaller than code would allow. Um, so this sign could also be 50 feet and 400 square feet, as could these signs. The applicant is proposing a 10-foot sign, 29 square feet, and a 30-foot sign at 281 square feet. Um, so the other three freestanding signs are well below the allowed square footage acting as a trade-off. They're also proposing limitations on size of electronic message centers, which is not um, something that is in our current city code. So the tertiary sign would allow fuel prices, and then this sign potentially in the future could allow electronic message centers or changeable copy. Um, our code actually could potentially allow that to be much larger, and they're proposing um, about 15% for that sign. Uh, staff believes that the proposed freestanding signs are con in, uh, consistent with the intent of the sign code because they promote a cohesive design, they reduce the overall amount allowed on the site, and they reduce the amount of the allowed size of all signs with the exception of the primary sign. And um, we also liked the prohibition on new single tenant freestanding signs which would reduce visual clutter on the site. Um, wall signs are allowed at a ratio of one square foot per one linear foot of store frontage. The applicant has proposed to increase that to a ratio of 1.5 square feet per one linear foot of frontage, uh, but with the trade-off that signs could not exceed 75% of the store frontage. So that means that, I guess, the, the sides of the, the um, sign couldn't take up the entire store frontage. Um, they've also expanded proposed expanding the allowance to include corners of buildings. Um, our sign code reads pretty specifically that wall signs are only allowed on 
uh, street facing frontages or major interior drives. But if you know Applewood Shopping Center, you know that a lot of um, the shops that don't actually face anything but a parking lot and they're kind of tucked behind where they would never be visible from a public street. Um, so they're proposing to allow uh, signs on all corners of buildings for, that, for a tenant that's in that corner unit. Um, and then they're also proposing limits on logos. We actually are not allowed to regulate sign content, but that is something that a landlord can regulate with a tenant. Um, and restrict plastic box signs, so they're kind of restricting the style of signs that would be permitted on the site. Um, let's see. So we find those requests to be appropriate. Um, given the orientation of the buildings, there are a lot of buildings that don't face um, major interior drive or a public street. So that corner allowance is appropriate. Um, and it, because it also comes with stricter standards, so they're not going to allow painted signs, there's a limit on the width of the signs, and there's restrictions on the type of sign and the logo percentage. They've also proposed internal wayfinding signs. Currently, there's no wayfinding around um, Applewood, as far as I know. Um, and it's, it's kind of a maze. So they're proposing a larger maximum height and size uh, just due to the size of the shopping center. And that would also give internal tenants that don't have street access um, additional, um, it would allow people to find them more easily. So this, oh sorry, I'm going back. Um, the city code only allows four foot signs for wayfinding, they're proposing eight feet tall. Um, and they also are proposing 10 square feet as opposed to four square feet. Lastly, I'll talk about non-conforming signs. So there are two non-conforming single tenant signs in the shopping center, Applejack and Chili's. Um, both of those could remain under this plan, but the landlord may impose private agreements with uh, the tenant that they would be responsible for enforcing. From the city's perspective though, these signs could remain. Um, by code, um, the city requires that if non-conforming signs are damaged, um, at a rate of 50% of their replacement cost, they must be replaced. Uh, the applicant is actually proposing to reduce that threshold to 33% um, as a trade-off for allowing those two single tenant signs to remain, but no new single tenant signs could be built. So a, a future tenant couldn't come in and, and want to erect a sign just for their business. They would have to use the multi-tenant signs I explained earlier. Um, all other signs, such as blade signs, temporary signs, uh, are proposed to comply with the city's standard regulations, so they do not need to be included in the plan. Uh, there was a referral process. Um, we had no concerns from outside agencies or city departments. Um, we did have a 15-day public hearing noticing for the Planning Commission. We didn't receive any formal uh, letters or emails. Um, I was contacted by three individuals, and I met with two in person, actually, and, and showed them the plans. Um, one did express their opposition to the plan. We are recommending approval uh, of the master sign plan. It was determined that the site is eligible and the plan promotes well-planned and well-designed cohesive signage as an update for the shopping center. And it will provide uh, some increased allowances in some cases, stricter requirements in other cases, but it's appropriate for the context and scale of the development. I'm able to answer questions you have, um, and the applicant is also here as well. Thank you. Commissioner Peterson. Yeah, I just have a, a couple questions on this. It's probably, it's about the, it's about illumination. Um, a, a couple places specify LEDs. One is a wash LED, and one just says LED. So um, we're not talking bare bulb LED, are we? I didn't hear that last part. Of Not talking what? Bare bulb LED. Uh, no, I think we we're referring to electronic message centers. Lauren's okay. correct. So it would be kind of like a, a an electronic message center can be either fuel price thing, um, which has the digital prices, or it could be more of those. I don't want to say TV, but kind video of screen. video screen. Um, where there'd be more like a television than which individual. Which would still be allows. subject to our code's illumination standards, which we just recently adopted in the sign code that has, um, they go into effect within the next year actually, where we can have a light meter that reads whether the illumination of that bulb or video screen is, is too bright or not. 
So, so you, you, but you do allow like TV screens and changing billboards and the like? Um, we do, it has to, there's limitations on how they change. Do you right, that? so there's, there's standards, I believe it's eight second transitions, so it can't just be like a video, it would have to be more like a PowerPoint where it could change an image every eight seconds. And that's an industry standard. We actually used to require 15 seconds and changed it uh, to eight seconds to match other cities. It's an industry standard or it's your standard? It's a municipal standard in terms of the research we did for the sign code. It's a, uh, we can have that discussion later. I don't think industries can dictate conditions for cities. Um, so you don't have any flashing electronics? None of these signs are flashing. Animation's not allowed for any signs in the city. Okay. What about scrolling? Nope. It's a message center, so Can't can move. it scroll? It's Can't gotta move. be an instant change of the message. Okay, and, it has, and at an interval? Eight seconds. Eight seconds. Okay. And the plastic box sign illumination? We allow plastic box signs, but are they illuminated plastic box signs? So the applicant's actually proposing to not allow plastic box signs, um, those rectangular boxes. Um, that was something that they wrote into the sign plan. Okay. Okay, that's all I, I, I that's fine. I went out there and drove around and um, it looks like your plan is a great improvement on what's already there, which is a bit confusing and not terribly obvious. Are you sure same mine? Yeah, just a question about the sign at PS1. I mean, it's pretty big, pretty massive compared to what's there now. And there's been, like you mentioned, a lot of disruption on Youngfield in terms of traffic. Putting this thing up, do you have any idea, you know, how long it would take to put up and what it might do to traffic for a short period of time? That would probably be a good question for the applicant. You're talking about the con physical construction of the actual sign and if it impacts traffic. Yeah, we, maybe the applicant could address that. And any work, just so everyone's aware here, um, any work that's done in the right of way, if you have to close traffic or anything like that, that's all routed through our public works department. So they'll review any applications for closing traffic lanes or rerouting pedestrians, and if, if that is required. It often, may be, it may not be. Yeah, often a sign of that size is sort of prefabricated, and it's just lifted with a crane pretty quickly. I know that's what happened at the corners, which is big, not quite as big, but they could probably elaborate. Thank you. Commissioner Hanson, Commissioner Larson. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I do have a couple of questions here. The first one is on um, on Exhibit Two, the zoning map. Uh, it shows a uh, a small inset uh, as Commercial One, and I believe that's where the mattress firm is located. Is that included in this? It is not. Um, so that is actually under separate ownership, um, and they have their own freestanding sign. They weren't a part of this deal. And their applications would have to conform with the city sign code. Correct. So they're not in the plan development either, so they would just meet our standard city sign code. Okay. Oh, um, can you explain to me a little bit more about what a way, wayfinder sign is? Does it indicate just turn left, or does it say turn left to go to the, uh, the Safeway or the, I'm sorry, the... King Super. So it's a, it's a directional sign, effectively. Um, it would have potentially business names with directions on them, with arrows, things like that. Um, I guess wayfinding is, I've, I've seen that more in an open space context where you have trail signs, um, but I guess in this case it would be more of a shopping center tenant oriented signs. And, and these are all interior, these are not on the? Correct, they would all be on private property. Okay. Um, the the, the requirement about damage to signs, um, I, if an existing sign is damaged, is, is this just apply to the two freestanding signs or is it in general? It would apply to any non-conforming sign. So those two freestanding signs that are non-conforming, that would apply, but it would also apply to any wall signs that are non-conforming as well. Okay, okay. Um, Okay, that, that, that's it for now, thank you. Commissioner Moss. I have a couple. Um, we are hearing this case because the applicant wants to put up various signs and get permission, or are they required as this type of a development to be heard for their signage? 
So it's a master sign plan, um, which would require, it's, it's basically a set of variances under the document called a master sign plan, which is something that the planning commission would be required to hear. We couldn't permit um, the sign size or locations just under the, the sign code. And, and the plan development doesn't call for any of these signs. Um, yeah, so our, so our sign code works really well for one business on one lot with one street frontage. And it, similar to sort of other zoning standards, it doesn't work quite as well for a property this large. The perimeter is almost two thirds of a mile. Um, it's just, it sort of needs its own unique set of rules. And if you're gonna request your own unique set of rules, it's often a give get. So they're asking for a few things that are bigger, but far, far fewer number of signs. Um, so it's kind of like a plan development in that it's like a negotiated sign plan. Um, but because this and sort of the corners and Kipling Ridge and Lutheran campus, those are just different animals from a sign standpoint and a size and a campus feeling. And the code requires that we bring those plans to you. We don't have any capacity to approve them administratively. Okay. And then um, when do we, or do we, get to see the materials, the shapes, the look, the style? You had a little bit of graphics there, but what's it made of? Do we get any process on that? Yeah, so there are, um, I know I recognize they're, they're black and white, but there are materials on here. And then um, when they apply for a building permit, all of this is public record. So throughout the process as they're applying for a building permit, um, you would be able to see like color elevations and, and things like that if you wanted to. But we don't see anything here at planning. No, this is the typical level of detail that we'd include in the sign plan. So similar to our standard code, it's mostly um, verbal. And I think Scott mentioned anything that's not addressed in here defers back to our normal code. Um, so we make sure that the language is clear enough that when we get a visual through that building permit that we can at least gauge whether it's meeting it or not. But this is the elevations of freestanding signs is typically the most you'd see um, of what they're gonna look like. So you're, you're saying the code already has requirements for material and shapes? We don't have material requirements. So it's typically just that the base is consistent with the primary building. Okay. In this case, Applewood, um, there's a lot of primary building materials, so that's why there's the table on this particular sheet, but we don't often have material requirements for other types of signs. Does that sound right? And, and the applicant is actually proposing all of the backing of the material for each sign to be consistent. So each business couldn't have a different color on there. It would be, you know, a, a color on the back and then letters on for each business as opposed to each business has multiple colors and different LEDs. It, it would be a consistent theme throughout where they would have the same backing color. Okay. Last question. This uh, hearing seems to be a accept or deny on the variances that they're asking for with the double the height, double the other interior, is that correct? So it's on the sign package in whole. So we, so Scott tried to outline sort of, here's what it would be, here's what, it, here's where they're asking for more, here's where they're giving up things. You know, it's allowed, they're allowed to have a 50 foot sign because they're highway oriented. Um, it's the square footage of that large one that's bigger than what we're accustomed to seeing. So we have 50 foot tall signs in the city. Um, I mean, so you're not look, you're not approving sort of each individual variance like the Board of Adjustment would. We're bringing to you like a plan development. Here is sort of, here's the package deal that they're asking for. You can put in conditions of approval if something were to come up or something's not clear. Um, but it's, it's not as much about sort of each individual request as much as, you know, given this context, given this perimeter length, given this size, given there's 20 plus businesses here, does this in totality make sense for this shopping center for the long run? We've been asking, we've been working with them and saying this makes sense for, we, it makes sense to do a master sign plan. We've been talking about it for years. It just hasn't sort of finally come into fruition. Um, so it's more about sort of that, the whole package deal. And I, thank you. And I guess I did have one final one. Those corner signs, um, are they a wood barbershop sign or attached to the building, stick out from it, those corners? So that would all be regulated under the city code um, as opposed to the sign plan. Um, so we do allow blade signs, we do allow barbershop poles, things, things of that nature. Um, and there are specific 
requirements within the sign code for blade signs. They can only stick out so far, they can only be so large, things like that. But because they weren't proposing to change the standards, it's not included in this package. Okay, thank you. And to add to your point earlier, I should have made it a little bit more clear, this, this entire site would be eligible for 50 foot tall signs because it's right across from I-70. Um, so anything within a quarter mile of an interstate in Wheat Ridge is allowed 50 feet. Mm -hmm. And they're actually proposing for three of their four signs to be shorter. Thank you. Commissioner Leo. Yeah, um, can you tell me, unless I missed it somewhere, what is the height of the current, the large sign that's in the middle? What is the height of that sign? It's not 50 feet. Um, I think the applicant may know, but I'm not, I'm not positive. I mean, is it close? I'm trying to, con I'm trying to conceptually visualize 50, 50 so, feet. So. so the existing um, Applejack sign and the existing Chili sign are both 50 feet. Oh. Those I know for sure are exactly 50 feet tall. Okay. The, the shopping center sign I believe is a little bit shorter. Okay, no, that, that's good because I was trying to visualize it. And there would be four freestanding. Correct. Right. And is there any point where that could be increased, or is that the package now? That's the package for this, and that would be what is approved. So if the applicant wanted to come in and say, we want a seventh sign or a ninth sign, which I don't think we'd get to that point, um, they would have to come back in with an amendment to the plan. Um, and you know, there are some abilities to approve administratively, but I think if we, they were proposing an additional freestanding sign of that scale, it would come back to, to you guys, Planning Commission. Okay, and just the one final. It is then it's the it's Regency that's requesting this, correct? Correct. Is that because of all the new, um, the work over of the whole area, the north area part? Is I mean, why are they at this point requesting that? I think that's a better question for the applicant, but I will say, we, as Lauren said, we've been um, kind of pushing them to apply for a master sign plan at some point, just to allow for more cohesive signage on the site, because right, right now you go out there and there's five different styles of signs and mm -hmm. there's not really a cohesive branding of the shopping center, but it, it did come from Regency. They, they applied and are requesting these changes. And it's currently zoned planned commercial development, so we have to go to that development plan every time a new business comes in and then comes to us and says, I want a new freestanding sign. We're like, we can't, you can't actually have one because right now you have an outline or a specific development plan and it doesn't allow for any more signs. So we've known, and we have 16 amendments to the shopping center. So we've known we needed one good document to look for with all the sign standards. Um, so it's from, in, from our standpoint, it's been time for a little while. Um, and I think it just sort of rose to the surface. They've had a lot of um, activity out there that is, that is drawing their attention elsewhere appropriately. All right, thank you. I have some questions. Um, the first one is, um, you talked about the, the site triangles don't apply to the, to the freestanding monument sign locations at signalized locations. Um, my my qu first question is, is what is the, I see a front elevation of the signs, but I do not see side elevations of the sign. What is the, what is the width generally for the 50 foot and the uh, 30 foot freestanding signs? I will have to defer to the applicant on that one. Um, and, and I'll save that question for the applicant. As I refer to um, page 404 that shows that elevation, it shows a, a person to scale. And I have some public safety and welfare con, uh, concerns about a person or a, I, I understand that there is not a current uh, uh, a bicycle dedicated bike lane along Youngfield and so therefore you'd probably be on the sidewalk um, which I understand is not permitted by the city but considering life or death with the car it, or a fine person probably would bike on the sidewalk um, also pedestrian um, I'm guessing that there is no way that a car or a person could see each other around that sign if it is placed um, too close to that uh, to the sidewalk. I, I really don't see how anybody could see around the base of that sign and that's why I have some really big concerns that just because it's a, a signalized intersection, how does that negate safety um, for pedestrians and, and cars that, that this um, 
that, that's my first question. So are you referring to the 50 foot sign then? The 50 foot and the 30 foot. I'm, okay. I'm thinking about the, the mass size, like just looking at the scale of the person to the scale of that base and how wide is that going to be and, um, and, and somebody's walking or somebody's biking and there's even, even there's a signalized um, that you just, I just don't see how a person or a car can see past that base. If it's pushed up mm -hmm. uh, close to the, um, you know, let's just say the sidewalk. I'm not going to say that necessarily the flow line, but wherever that edge of the sidewalk is, that I have a huge safety concern over that. So I'll respond, I guess, first to the 50-foot sign. Um, they're proposing a 15-foot setback. Um, the current sign is set back approximately 15 feet. Um, they also, um, at, at some point, um, there will be a six-foot amenity zone, um, and then the sidewalk will actually be behind that, um, an eight-foot sidewalk as opposed to the current about four-foot wide sidewalk. So things are going to be shifting back. I did a quick analysis of that sign. If for whatever reason, a site triangle did apply, and it, it wasn't even close in terms of failing a site triangle standard from, from the city's arterial perspective. For the 15, and I would probably agree with that, that with the 15-foot setback, but the 30-foot, they're proposing a one-foot um, from the right-of-way line. Correct, and again, the location of this sign is really TBD um, in terms of how this parcel ultimately redevelops. Um, they are proposing a one-foot setback. That is a minimum. If we find that there's an unsafe condition or public works believes that it wouldn't comply with the site triangle standard, I guess the site triangle would always supersede. So there, there's like a fail-safe in that public works would be looking at each individual location of the sign um, and making an analysis. The, the one foot is not like it's going to be built at one foot, but it could if it potentially met you know, it was a safe condition for site distance. Okay. And then the, um, the, other, the other signs have um, minimum setbacks. They're 10 feet tall. I don't know how wide they are, but they're five feet back from the, from the setback as well, the tertiary ones. And those I would, again, make, I have concerns over visibility and uh, adequate time that someone can see coming around those corners if they're placed near intersections, which the, they generally are. And even the, I'm not sure where the information on wayfinding sign is, but at, if it was two feet taller, it's now into the freestanding category. So it's, it's essentially a freestanding at eight feet tall because um, we're above the, the 36 inch site visibility. Um, so that, that's my comments on that. And then another concern I have is, um, where is the relationship of the the ones along the sign the freestanding signs along Youngfield to the existing power lines? I know that typically Excel does not want uh, trees over 15 feet height within 15 feet of those power lines. This is 30 feet and 50 feet. Um, where are they in relation to those overhead power lines? Believe the applicant can maybe corroborate this, but I believe that we're using some of our one percent funds to underground lines along the perimeter of the shopping center. So that's in the future. Mm -hmm. Okay. I was going to go back to the photo to kind of give you some context as well. So this this sign is kind of, I think that the new proposed sign would be a little bit back from where this one is. So that wouldn't interfere just as this one doesn't. Yeah. Um, and then you know as this northern site redevelops, that would also eventually get undergrounded as well. Um, Excel didn't provide any comments to us, but obviously we wouldn't just allow a sign to be built right directly under a power line. So again, that's something to be considered, but that's really more of a, a building permit down the line consideration okay. than something that would preclude a site plan or, or a sign plan approval. And then do you know um, the, the number four that we're, you're showing right there in that graphic I know that's proposed, but does the master sign plan incorporate existing as well as the proposed number of freestanding signs for this project? So the master sign plan defines separately the two existing um, non-conforming single tenant freestanding signs. That's a mouthful, but the two, the Chili's and Applejack signs are defined separately in the package um, because they are non-conforming and they're single tenant signs. So they're, they're defined separately. So, so 
Okay, I think I understand. So there's four proposed, and, and you're showing the four and the other ones that are non-conforming. And so if they ever went away, there's still only four. Correct. So they, we, they, we wouldn't allow like a new tenant to repurpose the Chili's sign, for example. Um, I mean, I guess that's a private agreement with the tenant and landlord because it's a non-conforming sign and that's allowed. Um, but we wouldn't allow an additional new freestanding sign for a single tenant if, for whatever reason, Chili's sign was demolished. And the existing multi-tenant signs are going away. Is that correct? Correct. Yeah, so the, uh, this one um, would be replaced by the 50-foot sign. And then this is another, um, the Walmart sign was another freestanding single tenant sign and that's being replaced by the new multi-tenant sign. Um, I have no further questions for staff. Uh, are there any other questions for staff? One more, okay. Um, is there a, uh, here's, here, I'm looking at this 1.5 to one ratio for wall signs. Mm -hmm. It's a 50% increase in the allowed square footage. Um, is, uh, I think it's true that, it, that, that like a wall sign that's script, the square footage is determined by a rectangle around the script. Right. So I'm looking at the King Supers. That has a very, very long, I don't know, I, I, there aren't dimensions on here, but that has a very long frontage. And so they can have a wall sign that's one and a half times the frontage. That's, yes, so we, so is we there a, is, um, go ahead. when it's not a box sign or a cabinet sign, um, on other sign plans we've had, you know, which doesn't set the precedent, but because the, when you go to channel letters, they're usually smaller than that box would be. So. Um, because you draw the smallest polygon is essentially how we do it. The smallest polygon that we can logically create the area for okay. um, is why the ratio typically increases when we, um, you know, we want to see more channel letters versus the boxes or the cabinets from a visual standpoint, and that's part of that give-get okay. that's being proposed. Uh, uh, okay, so King Supers has a long frontage. Is there a maximum size to a wall sign? It's just an absolute maximum. You can't have it over a thousand square feet. No. So King Supers could have a sign that illuminated most of the parking lot, right? G given the length of that frontage. I mean, with, with these small buildings, it wouldn't matter. So you're, you're mixing two things. So we only allow the internal illumination of the sign. And often, like for King Supers example, um, it might say King Supers photo pharmacy um, and like a Starbucks if they were inside. So it's the total sum of all of those words and text. So, you know, Lucky's, for example, I think they're at 1.75 of that, of that allowance because they gave up allowance on the side. So it's, I think when it's set back that far on a building that big, it doesn't actually appear to be grossly out of proportion with the building size, is what we've observed so far. But, but there is no regulation on the maximum size? No, no. We have, an, we have an overarching absolute max on freestanding signs but, and billboards, but not wall signs. Okay. And, and the applicant is proposing a cap on the overall width of the sign, so it couldn't take up more than 75% of the width. Yeah, but I could see a really bright 75%. Any other questions? Go I guess ahead. I just had one more. Um, you mentioned that you met with one person that had opposition. Um, can you share what that opposition was? Um, I, I, t my impression was that they had more general opposition about the operation of the, the shopping center and, and new construction, particularly the new Hacienda restaurant, um, and just kind of the excess amount of construction going on, traffic, noise, things of that nature. Um, I think there were some concerns, particularly about the 50-foot sign being too tall and potentially illuminating um, well beyond the property boundaries. But it, to, to my knowledge, it seems like most of the complaints were about kind of the shopping center and, and redevelopment generally. Any other questions for staff? 
Thank you. Just what one more, if you please, Mr. Chairman. I, I, I'm still uh, not quite past the, the main entrance sign at the uh, where the signalized intersection is. And if you if you recall that intersection, the egress from the par from the parking lot um, is separated by a an island of well, maybe 10, 15 feet. Um, and early on, there was a mention that that may be uh, reconfigured. And why would you put a sign right in the middle of something that might get moved? So that would be kind of done in tandem. I don't think they would be proposing to build a sign and then a year later to rip it out and move it. Um, I, that's definitely a better question for the applicant. There hasn't been a final design, at least that we've seen, that shows the location of the sign relative to any sort of reconfiguration of that intersection. But to me, that's not a practical solution. I don't think we would really want to accept a permit knowing the sign would be moved quickly. Have you had discussions about relocating it? The, the intersection or the sign? No, no, the sign. So the purpose of the master sign plan is to provide sort of the future vision. So there's no nothing that compels them to build these in, in a certain time period. Like with the variance, you have to bid, get a building permit within six months. That's not the way that this would be. So this is just sort of, here's what the vision is going to be. And um, when that gets reconfigured, the sign would be replaced. Um, and, and the goal here is to sort of lay this whole roadmap out now so that we don't have to to come back in a year whenever that might happen. So, so the part of the agreement is, is not to, to tell the operator that um, the sign has to go he exactly here. Right, these are all minimums, same as sort of our standard sign code. This is generally where they intend to put them. Okay, yep. thank you. Yes, yeah, so the final location could potentially shift based on the, that alignment. Any other questions for staff? Thank you. Um, if the applicant would come forward, uh, uh, you can make a presentation. If otherwise, I'm sure some of the planning commissioners have some questions for you. If you could state your name and address. Good evening. My name is Tom Metzger with Regency Centers, 8480 East Orchard Road, Suite 6900, Greenwood Village, Colorado. Um, I do have some of the artwork for the uh, signs that I can pass along. That'd I just be, have the one copy, great. but Thank if you want to pass it down. There's three pages, so the f first one's the 50-footer, the second page is the 30-footer, and that has the widths of the signs also. I think the 50-footer is about four feet wide, 30-footer is about two feet wide, and the 10-foot sign is one foot wide for scale. So you said the... How, what was the width of the 50 foot? Uh, he had, sir, is it? Oh, it's um, on, the, on those sheets? I think, it, okay. is it four feet, sir? Yep. Okay, thank you. And that's really a function of the structure needed inside the sign to hold something up 50 feet high with the wind loads and structural design. Did any of the, let's uh, start with Commissioner Peterson. Do you have any questions for the applicant? Commissioner Sam, I. Questions for the applicant? Do you have any questions? Uh, just real quick, how, how do you put these things in? I mean, is it quick? Is it? Like Lauren said, they fabricate these things in their shop and then bring it out. The 50 footer might have to be done in a couple sections, but they get it installed generally in the same day. They'll get the foundation done beforehand and then come in and set it in sections with a crane. And that intersection, we'll be working with the Public Works Department on reconfiguring that intersection. From what I can tell, we may end up um, moving the sign south and out of that island. The island will get a lot skinnier so that we have a left turn out, a straight lane out onto I-70 and a right turn out, and then we'll have some better lanes coming in. It's just all cattywampus right now. Mr. Hanto? Mr. Larson? Uh, no, I, I do appreciate your, your helping to clarify that question about the intersection because it really is a mess sometimes. It's terrible. Yeah. Sign's a good catalyst to, to fix it. 
Mr. Moss. Um, I don't know who would answer this, but I think Scott mentioned that that RTD area might go away and move somewhere. Do you have knowledge of that? Can you share? Yes, they're moving May 18th. They start their new service at Ward Road, I believe is where, and it's a bus transfer facility. There'll still be bus routes that go on Youngfield and on 38th, but this facility is actually sort of a driver's rest area. At the end of their route, they get a 15 or 30 minute break and they literally just use the bathroom, go to King Supers and get something to eat and relax a little bit. And they're moving that facility somewhere else. Um, May 18th is the new service route. So then that area will be parking? We're hoping it's a restaurant. Oh, Mike, put something there. Yep. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Liu? If, if I could just add one more, the, the well, I won't call it the four sign, but the sign on uh, 38th um, will be a 10 foot, no, I'm sorry, it'll be a, a 10 foot, the same size as the one on 32nd, right? Oh, right, okay, okay, and so that one would be oriented, I'm sorry, that one would be oriented to uh, face the traffic going east and west on 38th? It would be perpendicular to 38th so that eastbound and westbound traffic, it's two-faced signs so that each be able to see either direction. Okay. Okay. Thank you. I don't have any questions either. Do any other uh, commissioners have any more questions for the applicant? Thank you. I, I do have one point of clarification. Um, it wasn't until I listened to Scott read it um, with respect to the non-conforming freestanding or the non-conforming signs our intent with lowering the percentage from the city standard of 50 percent when it's damaged it needs to be replaced it can't be repaired if it's non-conforming our intent for that lowering it to 33 percent was really for non-conforming wall signs so if a tenant has a box sign for example Box signs are not going to be allowed in the future, but passing this sign plan wouldn't um, obligate the tenant to replace their sign. Um, we would just eventually phase those out as a tenant rolls over and leaves, um, but we don't want to impose a burden on a small business that you know we've changed the sign criteria and maybe they built a sign two or three years ago. We wouldn't have, want to have to force them to change the sign, but uh, the idea is if one of those non-conforming signs is starting to become worn out and look bad and maybe gets damaged, that's a trigger to get rid of it. We do want to get rid of the non-conforming signs but not put a financial burden on the tenants. It, it really wasn't our intent on the two non-conforming freestanding signs to impose that same burden. Um, for example, the, the Applejack sign years ago blew over in a windstorm. Um, if the way it's written right now, that would mean he, he couldn't put it back up. And I don't think any of us want Applejacks not to have a freestanding sign. Um, so that wasn't our intent. If, if it's okay, we could maybe clarify that to say that the non-conforming replacement standard is for wall signs. And sorry, I didn't pick up that sooner. Yes. Tom, Tom is actually correct on that point. Um, so the, the freestanding signs for the Chili's restaurant and also the Applejack sign, um, that is a private agreement between the landlord and tenant, um, whereas the other non-conforming signs would, would have to comply with that 33%. Um, so they, they have a separate private agreement for those signs specifically. And, and the, t the, the question came up um, that Scott addressed, if Chili's leaves, that sign is gone. A new tenant that comes in there would get a panel on that 50-foot sign. There would not be a new, new sign for a new tenant there. If there was no reason why they would have to replace their sign, it's not deteriorated or anything, but 
you would like to see it replaced. Is there any incentive to that business to assist them to replace the sign? We do eventually come to that point where if they're a long-term tenant, the sign's not very nice. We'll work with them to say, hey, if we split the cost, can we get this thing replaced? It's awful. Um, we also, generally the tenants have five-year leases, and so there's a renewal option at five years, and that's usually a good point to t have that discussion with them, and we'll say, if you want another five years, you're, you need to replace your non-conforming sign. And we, uh, maybe we help them out with that a little bit, give them a little remodeling allowance or something like that. Okay, but, thank you. Mm -hmm. If the commission is willing to entertain that suggestion that we add that clarity, if you could just add a note at the end of the motion with the following condition that the um, non-conforming provision be clarified and we'll know what that means and just add that word wall into item C on page well, two. And I, I'm sorry, I, I have another clarification point. Um, the commissioner here at the end uh, brought up a pretty good point on the anchor and we typically have a sign criteria on all of our shopping centers that regulates signage sizes and types. And the city's been pushing us to do something like this for a while and I think the Walmart releasing effort triggered this. Um, but we're glad to be doing it. But in the process of, of doing this with the city, I think we submitted a plan that was really more like our private sign criteria that just between us and our tenants. And we usually have a distinction between small tenants of a certain size and what signage they're allowed versus the large anchors. And in the process of working with the city staff, the city staff said, well, a lot of that stuff is really private agreements. And what got lost in that that I realize now is that the anchors, if you apply that 1.5 square feet per linear foot, King Supers could have a ridiculously large sign. Um, so I, I don't want to not have our sign program approved, but I, I guess I'd like to say if, if you could put a condition out, we'll work with staff to say that we could come up with a maximum on, on the anchors based on square footage like we've used in other shopping centers so that something didn't get out of hand. Thank you. Are there any other questions for the applicants? Thank you. Thank you. Okay, I will now move into the Citizens Forum. I see no one in the audience, so I will close the Citizens Forum. Uh, would you, would the commissioners, uh, we could either entertain a motion now and, and then go through that and then we can have a discussion or if you want to have a discussion first before we go through the motion, that is another option. We, yeah, we, let's, I suggest we put out a motion out there and then have a discussion. Okay. We could use it maybe a little, one more run through on the conditions. Sure. Um, so if I could recommend that after <clears throat> reason number three, you put something about, and with the following conditions, one, um, an edit be made to bullet C on page two regarding non-conforming signs to clarify the damage for wall signs. And condition two be that the applicant work with staff to create a maximum size allowance for wall signs for a tenant over a certain square footage. And if you didn't want to read that back verbatim, you could just make the motion and say, and with the conditions as presented by staff. And we will capture that. <laughs> we go back and watch the videotape in these instances. And get <laughs> uh, Mr. Chairman, I'd like to suggest a motion here. 
uh, I move to approve case number WZ-18-23, a request for approval of a master sign plan for a planned commercial development located on the east side of Youngfield Street between 32nd Avenue and 38th Avenue for the following reasons. The site is eligible for a master sign plan. Number two, the master sign plan promotes a well-planned and well-designed signage. And number three, the master plan is consistent with the intent of the sign code and is appropriate for the context of the development. And we'd like to add a condition regarding the discussion ha held this evening on non-conforming signs. And uh, as well, uh, on, uh, add a condition on the discussion uh, held tonight on uh, the staff developing a maximum sign, uh, uh, maximum sign size for uh, square footage. Close, but I don't know if we, if we got quite got there. Is there a second? Any discussion? Uh, quickly, the effective date of something like this, if we approve it tonight. Uh, it's when when recorded. So we would request the edits to the final document and then provide it for signatures and then it takes effect as soon as it's recorded at Jeffco. So, so this, uh, the, the, the changes we made tonight and whatnot would be incorporated in that version? They will be incorporated, okay. yes. Right, thank you. I would, I would, uh, I can't make any conditions as the chair, but I would hope that, um, I'm, I have no objections to the um, push in the science board um, closer to the right of way line. Uh, I just want to, I just want to make sure that staff considers site visibility triangles, whether or not it's signalized or not for just for safety reasons. Um, Let me say, I think that it's already a provision in the sign code that you have to meet the site triangle. I, I um, found it did. I looked at And it would sign. defer to, if it it's like not otherwise permit. trumped by this, it would defer yeah. to that so I can. Because um, there was a, one of the documents I looked at, it's a city we were signed permitting and it's a lengthy document um, that goes through and I. Yeah, so section 26707, general provisions, no sign allowed which would violate the size distance triangle requirements so I think we're covered just by the standard code okay. to address those concerns that it would trump whatever designs or setbacks are proposed here as it would for any sign that's proposed in the city okay because yep. some of the on the documents before us it says minimum you know one foot setback right. and I just want right want to make sure that that can't be Trump so yep. any other discussion does does the <clears throat> new lighting I guess plural ordinances, does that automatically apply? It applies to new signs. Um, it, it doesn't yet apply to existing signs, but will retroactively. So the new LED or video message, it would apply to those. Okay. Yes. And to add to that, we received confirmation from the sign installer that they will be installing the dimmers that are required by code for these signs. Off the topic of the sign, but that was brought by the uh, the applicant. The mention of uh, the possibility of changing that main intersection off of Youngfield um, entrance. I would be extremely in favor of that. <laughs> <laughs> Are there any other discussions? Okay, call for a vote. Motion, well, motion passed seven to zero. Thank you. No old business. Um, the only new business is to again affirm that we are having our dinner and training on the 18th. We will do dinner at 6 p.m. in our conference room. We will do the formal training session at 7 p.m. starting in this room. Um, and we will send out information on those details. And I think Commissioner Voss had something she wanted to share with the group. Thank you. I had two uh, things. First of all, I've got a pass out from a newspaper article. It's talking about a Golden Planning Commission meeting uh, that uh, they're having. 
so I just wanted you to be aware of that. And then today, I just got my planning magazine, which I have not gotten for a year. So I didn't know. We had some issues with uh, American Planning Association. Um, it's happened before, so if you have that issue and moving forward, let us know. You're all supposed to be getting that publication as I was. I was in the same boat, so yeah. it yeah, wasn't, wasn't personal. Yeah, yeah, I didn't think it was personal, but I was like, what happened? Usually we get them delivered here, so I'm glad to know that you got them at your house because I've been waiting for them. <laughs> well, I have been getting it at the house, but like all last year, none. So I don't know. We don't either. Oh, okay. APA. Okay, thank you. We have a membership. The city pays for the membership for the commission, um, and we keep it updated, but evidently they weren't keeping it updated. So you would receive that publication as a benefit of, through the city's membership. Not really. Not really. <laughs> Any other questions or comments? Just a, a, a note, uh, Mr. Chairman, on this past Tuesday night, April 2nd, I attended the, uh, a seminar held uh, by the American Institute of Certified Planners in Englewood, uh, where the discussion centered on short-term rentals. Mm -hmm. And there were uh, representatives of Lakewood, uh, two people from Denver and somebody from Englewood. And uh, the discussion on how Denver has uh, approached the uh, short-term rental issue was very interesting. So uh, I just wanted to put that out there, and, and uh, I believe uh, Wheat Ridge, uh, it's an issue that the city of Wheat Ridge is looking at now. Correct. Any other questions or comments? Is there a motion to adjourn? Motion we adjourn. Second. Second. Any discussion? Call for a vote. Motion passed seven to zero. <laughs>